Hey guys, Hunter here with the Grab Matters Podcast. Um, I first and foremost just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been listening, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing. It helps so much to get the podcast out there to everyone. I also want to say that I did get some merch up on the website now. Got some long sleeve shirts, some short sleeve shirts, got a mug. We'll probably end up getting some more stuff up on there as well. Also started up a Patreon. So if you're interested in a little bit of behind the scenes access, um, seeing who the guests are early, stuff like that, um, definitely check that out. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. Enjoy the episode. Water boarding. They're talking about weight boarding. The thing about weight boarding. Every trick is an inward. Backside. Backside. Air railing. A new dimension. So welcome back to the Grab Matters Podcast. Today we have Sean Murray on the podcast. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing great. Good to have you, man. Thanks for making the drive out. Um, I'd like to start off with just a few quick questions. Wake pants, yes or no? Uh, absolutely. On special occasions. Okay. Um, I've, I've worn them once, maybe twice. And Jet Pilot came out with some of these probably are like 98, 99. Um, okay, so official Jet Pilot. Yeah, I, I wore them. Am I going to go wear them now? Probably not. Uh, but I did listen. I did, I did peruse the Rusty podcast, mm-hmm. and I heard this. Um, and it gave me an idea. Uh, don't tell Rusty this yet. Um, but I want to take him to a thrift store, and we're going to pick each other's outfits out to go ride in. Okay. They might be pants. They might not. I don't know. I like but, it. But thank you for the idea. For a good little content idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, but wake pants right now, I mean, I don't know. I, I might go skinny at this point. Skinny, you know? like tight wake pants? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Like some track pants. I don't know. Like Adidas track suit? Yeah. It could, it could work. I don't know. I don't know. I think I, they're pretty good at the cable. I, behind the boat, I don't know. Talk to yeah, Shane. They were that. so oversized. Huge. Baggy. Yes. Yeah. Um, another question. When was the last time you did a 900? Um, I don't know, maybe a week ago. Really? Yeah. Okay. But like toe nine, not heel nine. Sure. Yeah. I mean, nine's a nine, but toe nine. Very impressive. Yeah. Well, thanks. You're the oldest one to do a 900 behind the boat. I'm, I have to imagine. I don't know. Jerry Nunn holds strong with those pretty. Yeah. I probably. Okay. I don't know. I'm 47. I'd, like, I'd, I'd be curious on that. I don't know. Getting up there. You going to do one at 50? That's a good goal. That'd be a good video. I haven't done a 10 yet, and I still have that, like, on my to-do list. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think it could happen. I hope so. You could do a, you know, the, I don't know if you follow Tony Hawk, but he did a, uh, it was like 50 tricks at 50, I think, and it was some of his most iconic tricks, including the 900. Um, and he went and cracked it off? Yep. After a bunch of slams, but he got it. Wow. So it's a pretty iconic video. So we'll do uh, 50 tricks with Murray at 50. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's dive into to early life of Sean. Um Growing up in California, getting into water sports, kind of run us through those those early days. Uh, middle of three boys, and um, we would skateboard, surf, baseball, uh, all sorts of stuff. And my dad got us a boat because we went out with some, with, with some friends that had water skis and got up on skis at like eight, eight years old. I just realized these lights are on. All right, early, early days of Sean growing up in California. So middle of three boys, we would do all sorts of sports from like baseball, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and my dad got us our own boat that came with water skis. And so we, we got into skiing when I was probably like nine years old or so. And the scurfer came out when I was, I was 11. And the funny story is, and I'll try to give you brief as possible, but, um, we were in San Diego out in the Carlsbad Lagoon and my dad had just purchased a brand new kneeboard that day. And we watched this guy go by us standing up on what looked like a stand-up kneeboard. And I was like, Dad, I want that stand-up one. Now, keep in mind, my dad was like all about supporting me and my brothers. Like, whatever we wanted to try, he was for it. But he just bought this kneeboard. And this guy goes by, and I say, I want that. And he goes, mark my words, you will never have one of those. (laughs) Looking back at the time frame, that was Tony Finn, like in the early days of the Scurfer, just getting started. And 12 years old, we moved from... uh, Southern California to St. Louis, Missouri, because my dad was a pilot for TWA, and that was their hub, Transworld Airlines. And we moved on to a lake, and that was kind of the saving grace of moving from Southern California to the Midwest. And he had just gotten uh, me a scurfer at that point, the scurfer rage. And it was like on my 12th birthday, loaded that thing up, moved to the Midwest, and I was scurfing off and running. But at the same time, I was like not just scurfing, I was skiing and all sorts of different stuff between 
like learning to barefoot as a young kid and just playing out on the water all the time. So that was kind of my, my kickoff. And I was in St. Louis, Missouri, my middle school, high school years. Okay. Um, that's I hilarious jumped ahead. That, that Tony Finn is, was the one riding that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it is kind of crazy. And, and we tell that story. He's like, yeah, you've told me the story. <laughs> yeah. It's a funny story. Um, so you, wh- why didn't, why was your dad so against not, I wouldn't say against, you know, getting you one of those, but was it like a, oh, we're water skiers and like, that's what we no, do? No, not or? at all. Okay. No, not at all. No. Um, because we weren't water skiers. We were a family that was new to the sport. Okay. Um, it was more of like, I just bought you this. You're acting spoiled, you know, okay. like, gotcha. it, like it, he, he was all about just whatever you guys want to try, except the day that you just got something. So, you know, that's fair. I mean, that what, was every it. single day you see something new, you say, I want that. Yeah. Come on. Right. <laughs> Um, okay. So that first scurfy you got in St. Louis, what age was that? And what kind of, what boat did you guys have on that lake? So we had this like runabout boat. It was called a galaxy tri hall. And, um, it was like a snub nose boat. It kind of looked like, like a G now. And it's funny. Cause like, if you look at it, you're like, well, it kind of looks like the skeleton of a G. But when we moved to St. Louis, we had gotten a ski boat and we got a pro star 190. It was a mastercraft. And so I had that uh, growing up. But when we moved there, I was 12 years old, and I couldn't take that out. I was too young. Um, and my dad had gotten us a uh, – it was mainly just for me because um, my older brother, he could take the ski boat out. But I got a John boat, like a little fishing boat, 12-foot aluminum thing, 15-horsepower Mercury engine on the back. Still have the engine. and Still runs? Yeah. Uh, still that's, got it. Still yes, got it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get it running. There you go. Um, but that was like what I spent so much time on the lake. Me and my buddy, Jeff Danielson, he and I still hang out to this day because he ended up moving down to Florida as well. And uh, we actually rode today. I no was way. wakeboarding. He foiled. I, yeah. So we, we, that was my growing up was a lot behind a little fishing boat. Okay. Um, it, I mean, 15 horses, probably not enough to ride behind back then. Or did you try it all? I'm like, people think I'm six foot tall. You meet me, you're like, wow, you're a short dude. Um, I've always been pretty small and at I was when I was like 12 13 years old learning to barefoot I could barefoot behind that 15 horse okay like eventually it would start to slow down but I could do it okay sweet because I had a I had a little six horse on a I don't know 10 foot you know similar style boat and you probably could ride behind it with enough surface area but it wasn't maybe foil uh, now <laughs> you could definitely it. foil behind it now I'm sure you can right. foil behind anything so um talk about St. Louis so you weren't really into the wakeboard scene in California right I mean it, well, because it didn't it, exist, it didn't exist but, yeah, it or didn't the water exist. sports scene, I guess you should say. Yeah. So I was going to kind of compare growing up in California versus St. Louis because they're very different places. Yeah. So in California, I was either at the baseball field, I was in scouts. So we did a lot of camping um, or I was at the beach. And so surfing, boogie boarding. Um, but we camped all summer long. Somehow my dad convinced my mom that it was normal for people to camp all summer long. Like every weekend? No. Like, leave the house as soon as school <laughs> is out and just camp. Like, and we did that. We, sorry. You're good. I'm going to pick up that. Yeah, I will too. <laughs> so you're talking Memorial Day to Labor Day, basically. Yeah, it was crazy. And my, my dad was like, yeah, that's everybody does this. And we would load up, uh, before we had a boat, we would just load up the station wagon with the tent and go. And we would go up and down California camping all summer long got a boat then we started towing it and so we would find lakes that had campsites and things on them there's this one lake in california uh, i think it's mcclure like where mike Schven yep, yep. is that has floating campsites and so you can pull your boat up to this thing and it's like this dock that's just this box that's all open and you have a, a bottom floor and an upper floor and you can set your tent up on it has a little barbecue hanging off the side that's rad yeah, it's floating campsites. I think they still exist. Hope so. So we would camp all summer. That was my upbringing. Okay. Um, so let's keep diving into to riding. So when, when you get to St. Louis, when when's the point of you have a scurfer maybe making some modifications to the bindings? What what age is that and when you start riding a lot? I guess. So moved to St. Louis in in 1988. And right after that, the, the, the first Hyperlite came out. And it was uh, it's called the Hyperlite. The second version was a Hyperlite Pro. But my buddy Jeff, who I told you about, he got the first Hyperlite. I didn't have it. I had my scurfer. And the first version didn't have a heel strap. And so we took luggage straps 
um, I don't think it had it on it, but either way, like it was either on our scurfer or the first type like we sewed our own heel straps on. And then the, the, the hyperlight came out with the purple heel straps are like, Oh, game on. Now we could try to flip. We would try to flip and it wasn't working out. Yeah. Um, and then I got the hyperlight pro and that was when I, um, actually linked up with Darren Shapiro to come down to Florida to take a couple days of lessons. Because my buddy Jeff, he somehow got Darren's number and went to his wakeboard camp. You know, I thought I was going to like a camp, you know, and it was in his apartment and I slept on his couch. But it was awesome because I learned the proper physics of riding over two days. And that changed like the sport for me because then I was like, oh, this is different than I thought. Like how you load up pressure and the line tension and all that. And uh, when I came down to Florida, so I was 15 years old my 15th birthday and I remember because he took me to I think Denny's and because you get a free meal on your birthday there you go <laughs> so he took me to to Denny's and uh I came down doing like a couple different flips a couple spins and I was trying the railing it wasn't working out but once he taught me how to jump the wake uh I went back home and everything started clicking so this is when I was like 15 16 years old okay so are you getting, are you doing any contests after that? Are there any contests in St. Louis, you know, maybe some grassroots ones or people hanging out and the only thing, the only contest at that point was the pro tour. And that wasn't anything I, I yeah. even had my radar on. I would watch it, the, the TV show is called hot summer nights. And I would watch that and thought, well, that would be cool to do that. But I never thought I would do it. And I remember one day my mom's walking through and she goes, you could beat those guys. I'm like, yeah, right, mom. That's like the, I told you, I go, that's your Brady Bunch answer. Like, that's, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And uh, so. So no contest, really. You're riding they, through high school, like yeah. those high school years, just riding a lot in the in the summer. Yeah, there literally was not a contest. Okay. Uh, there was, I think I did like some kind of slalom tournament at one point. Okay. But I, I had no business being there. I've just, yeah. Just something to do that's on yeah. the water. Yeah. Yeah. And so didn't do any contests. And then the First thing, well, I moved down to Florida to go to college. Yeah. Um, and worked at a ski school called the Benzel Ski School, which turned into the World Wakeboard Center. Andy and Andy Hansen, who's Trevor Hansen, Reed Hansen's dad, he had just purchased it from Dave Benzel, who's Tara Mikasich's dad. And so I moved down to work at that ski school with my brother, Chris. And so while we were working there, um, that's where I was coaching three event and I was like the ski board coach and my brother was the knee board coach. So this is 1994. Okay. I, got, I didn't I, know your brother was down there with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We both moved down. We drove down in the Honda civic, loaded it up with all, all of our gear and, uh, brought my ski board, my Hyperlite pro down. Okay. So this was right after high school, after you graduated. Yeah. And this was your plan was to go to college at what, what was the school down here that you were? Uh, Florida Southern. Okay. And I know you had kind of a goal or I don't know if your goal was to be a pro wakeboarder back then. Probably wasn't. But I mean, because pro wakeboarder, there's probably not that many of them. No, it's just. Skiboarder or whatever, standing on the water. Um, did you have kind of an agreement with your dad when you were in, in college that you were going to take a semester off and start pursuing that? I don't know if we want to fast forward through that part or not, but. Yeah. So, well, that that's basically where we are because. Okay. I was working at the ski school and then I went to college um, and what drew me to Florida was that there were ski schools or sorry, not uh, there were ski teams at the colleges down here. And so I was either going to go to Rollins or Florida Southern and I checked out Rollins. I was like, I don't know if that's my speed. I want to go Florida Southern. So I went there. I was on the ski team, which was three event. And so slalom trick and jump. And while I was there, uh, my coach, his name was Mark Richard. He was like this pro kneeboarder, but he was our ski coach. He calls me in my dorm room. Okay. There's no cell phones at this point. This is 1994. And he calls me in my dorm room. He goes, Hey, bring your ski board into my office. I want to, I want to see something. And he, uh, he pulls out the rule book and he goes, check this out in the, in the ski tournament guidelines. It says if your trick ski is one third as wide as it is long, it's a trick ski. So he measures the thing, does the math, and he goes, I want you to ride this at the next tournament. So this is a three-event tournament, slalom, trick, and jump. It's like, ski boarding is still new. And so comes time, and people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I can ride this. And, like, the judges are all like, what's going on? And he's like, here's the rule book. And so I go and ride it, and 
I, I get like a decent score because like compared to what, how I could trick ski, I could, I could ski board a lot better. Yeah. Like wakeboard a lot better. Um, the fun thing about the, the college tournaments is that you get one pass down and that's it. And so then you got to come back. So on the way back, that's what I'm doing. Like Rayleigh. just freestyle. Yeah. Scarecrow, Rayleigh, Hoochie Glide, a bunch of this stuff. But like my trick one was like line over and toe back roll and like all the trick ski tricks. And so Ronnie, her name was Ronnie Bischoff, who, uh, or Barton, but now she's Ronnie Bischoff. She's Chris Bischoff. He runs a tour and everything nowadays. She was skiing against me for Rollins. And she was at such a high level of, of skiing that she would be a, uh, a, a judge. And she pulls me aside. She goes, hey, just so you know, your, your toe roll to, to revert, you're spinning the wrong way. We should give you no credit, but I'm going to give you credit. Because they go blind. They do like a toe roll to blind on okay. a trick ski. It's like considerably harder. I don't know why they did that. But they fully like go the hard <laughs> way on it. And uh, she's like, but I'm, I'm going to let it slide. I was like, well, thanks. You know, so I did that for a while and then it turned into this thing. So I was the first person to go and like ride a wakeboard as a trick ski. And then they're like, well, you got to take the fins off. That was, I had left school at that point. And I don't know. Now they might have their own division. I don't know. Okay. 25 years ago. So while I was uh, skiing there, um, I go back. I, so I do one full year at college and then I go back into the ski school. And while I was there, like week one, Eric Perez comes to guest coach. I mean, come on, Eric Perez. Like I was so pumped. Like if you know the sport, this is like one of the godfathers. It was Darren Shapiro, Eric Perez. Like those were two of the, the faces of Hyperlight. And he came to guest coach and he also brings the bath, the first twin tip Hyperlight made. He goes, check out this board they just came out with. This is 1995, like May of 95 maybe March, I don't know, sometime in the spring. And it goes, try this board out. And also, there's this tournament going on down the road called the Masters Challenge. I have no idea what that was, but it was at Jack Travers, Sunset Lakes. And it was to qualify into the Masters competition where they were just putting in wakeboarding for the first year. I had no idea what it was. This is my first, like, kind of contest. And so going there... Uh, I'm riding this board that I hadn't ridden before, but I really liked it. It was the first twin tip. And so when I get there, it's Byerly and Kobe and like Gator, Jeremy Kovac, Andre Gaetan, like Weddington. Everybody is there trying to qualify in round. It's a two day event. Round one did awesome. I was like, oh my gosh, look at my name on the running order. Like I'm, I'm hanging in with these guys. This is crazy. Day two blew it. Like did not do well. Didn't make it into the Masters that year. As I'm leaving the, the parking lot, this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, I want to introduce myself. My name is Tom James. I'm the editor of Wakeboard Magazine. And uh, the, the shortened version is he goes, you're good. You should try to ride on the tour. I'm like, that's kind of cool. My dad was there. He happened to come down. He, he, because he was a pilot, he could fly down. And, and so we get my Volkswagen bug. Um, and so as we're driving away, we're like, how do we, how do we do this? Like, you don't look it up on the internet at this, at this point, you have to make phone calls or look in a phone book. Or I don't know. Like we, we figured it out. And so we started to travel around on the tour. And so that was my first like real kickoff to where I was like, can I make this happen? Yeah. And we also learned there was a little bit of a political side to the sport and the judging and things like that. Okay, so let's talk about, <clears throat> for a lot of people probably don't know how wakeboarding was scored back in those days. It was yeah. basically scored on a point system, right? Yes. So what's that, what are the tricks in the point system? You don't have to go into a super specific, but what was it like back then? So you scoring? get two passes that had to be within 25 seconds. So they literally have a, a stopwatch because this is kind of trick ski based. And that's where like, well, this is how we judge trick skiing. We need some something. And so it was because it just had just started. Yeah. And... So the, the tricks all had a point value. And so you could do a tantrum. It was like 1,100 points. You could do an indie tantrum for 1,150. You could do a switch indie tantrum for 1,250. And then I came up with, I invented the Bel Air, like an air tantrum. My middle name's Belmont, and so the Bel Air came from there. Um, do it with no wake was like 1,300 points or something like that. And so I don't remember if those are the exact points. Sure, yeah. But you had to do these tricks that you wrote down ahead of time. And so if you didn't, <laughs> you didn't know that. I, 
Well, no, I did not. <laughs> you, ha- you had to do what you wrote down in the order that you wrote them, the exact order. And if you didn't do it, no credit. So there were some guys that would write it down on their board. Some guys would sharpie it on their arms. But you would try to just like practice your run enough to know what you did because you had to do it spot no on. No improvising. Yeah, and you had to like, like, like be on point with your timing just to make sure you got it done. And at that point, we're starting to let our ropes out a little bit longer. Kobe was the first one to tell me to let my rope out. You know, showed me how to hit the double. From up. what to what? So, like, what distances? Did you? I mean, I was using a ski rope previous to this, and so I was riding it, like, probably 15 or 22 off, which means your rope is, like, 55 to, you know, 60 feet. Yeah. Like, pretty short. But that's what we came from. And so he's like, let your rope out, let your rope out. And, and so we were probably getting out to like 70 feet. And so okay. that started to make the, the runs harder to fit in time. Yeah. Um, but that's that was like the, the, the basis. You like legit had to do it exact. So you get to the end and they're like, you didn't do this. And you, ah, like I just flew across the country and I did these tricks out of order. I forgot which one I was supposed to do yeah. there. Um, was this before or after that Pro-Am challenge in St. Louis? <laughs> the Pro-Am, wow. That was, so the first real tournament was Pro-Am challenge in St. Louis. And that was, that was, I think that was my first year. Uh, Cause you were in Florida then, right? And then yeah, you flew I, up. Yes. Okay. And I flew back. Okay. And so they had this where you could like, you had all these amateurs that could then try to challenge into the pro tour. So I think that was in 94. Okay. So it was before the master's challenge. Okay. Um, so that was my first real introduction into it. And uh, had like a decent, like I got some funny stories from there, but had a, had a decent run. But one of the things like it's, it's amazing how impactful somebody's encouraging words to you can be. And I'll never forget Kobe Mika said, she's like, dude, your shifty twister you did was rad. I still remember that it was so many years ago, that was yeah. 30 years ago. Like, so to have somebody say something, so don't ever forget like how impactful just, just pointing something out you think is legit. Like somebody can really be impacted by that. Um, I was sitting down on the ground in the rider's area where everybody's boards are and stuff. And uh, my board is there, and I get up and I walk away. And when I come back, Darren, who I kind of knew because I went and took a couple days of lessons at his house, I come back, and he's sitting there, and I see him sitting next to my board kind of like picking something off. And I see that he's picking these stickers off of my board. And I had taken this performance ski and surf that had these like tribal designs and I put it on the tip of the board because I thought it looked cool, but I wasn't thinking about how I covered up Shapiro, his name. I was like, what are you doing? He goes, you covered up my name. <laughs> so, that, that was funny. Sorry, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that was my first real introduction and then the master's challenge and then competing on the tour. Um, okay, so let's, yes. let's talk about the tour. Yeah, I guess your mom told you that you could beat these guys yeah when you started that first year on the tour and you're flying around did you think like hey I could I could hang with these guys or I mean obviously to a certain extent you had to think that to to enter but did you think you could beat some of them no I didn't think that I was gonna win okay you know because there's certain things like they were doing I was like I don't know if I'll if I'll do that but I was like I might be able to like get a give them a run for their money kind of thing yeah but I I didn't think like oh I'm gonna go win a tour yeah no a lot, of, a lot of big names back then that were riding for riding their ski boards for a while before you started. Yeah. Um, what were the purses like back then, that, that first year? The two pretty much the same as they are now. <laughs> pretty low? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it was anywhere from like three to five grand for first. I don't know. Okay. I, like, I feel like they just haven't changed. <laughs> plane, plane tickets have gone up, but yeah, <laughs> purses haven't changed all too yeah. much. Um, th- that uh, I think it was the first... First stop in was that in Seattle that year? No, because that was the last one. Okay, but th- but that's when you got in touch with Hyperlite. So I went to a few stops, didn't make it through, and it was when I was in Portland. Okay, and and I remember feeling kind of different there. Like my confidence was building. Like the conditions there weren't great, but I was used to just kind of riding and whatever. And I was just like, okay, now I start to get this system of what I need to do, and um. I put it together and I made it into the finals. And I don't remember the place I got. Uh, my dad says I got second. I feel like I got third or something like that. But this might even been before the finals. All of the guys from Hyperlight introduced themselves to me. I remember where I was standing by by this like the up near the this pavilion. There's a bunch of restrooms in the area and there's this big cement pad that I was standing on and 
Herb O'Brien, Paul O'Brien, uh, Eddie Roberts, Guy Phillip. Um, oh, like it, it was just this lineup of like, wow, this is Hyperlight. Like they started in 91, but Herb O'Brien started H.O., Herb O'Brien started O'Brien. Like, these are the guys I was like, dude, th this is it. And I was already riding their board. And they, and they, they come up and like, hey, we want, we, we want you to come by the factory next weekend at the Seattle Tour Stop, and we want to sign. We want to sign you. Oh. <laughs> like, Let's okay. go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, so um, that was kind of like the big, whoa, this is happening. Yeah. And when I went up there, um, I totally blew the tour stop, like f blew it. Like, I, and I think it was probably like a little bit my own fault because I messed with, with Gator going off the dock. How so? He, I, I, I kind of knew Gator, but not really. He was, he was still pretty mysterious. Like to the, now he's a good friend of mine. Like he's an awesome guy. Um, but as he's getting, the boat is pulling away and <laughs> the line is about to tighten up. And I go, hey, do you always ride with your fins backwards? Oh, you're you're that guy. I I don't. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was funny, and and he's like, what are you talking about? And he like looks down, and I'm like, I'm just kidding. They're fine. And he goes off, right into his head. Yeah, like I think he did pretty good. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, bad that's bad karma I, for you. That's what I get. Yeah. So, but I did sign that contract with Hyperlite. So that's when I, that was the very end of the season. And back then, there was this massive break between the tour, the last tour stop, and Worlds. Like, literally, like, two months. Like th it wouldn't happen until, like, November. Mm. And so I was in school, and my dad drove our boat down so I could train. So I was at school training for Worlds, and um, I got the bright idea that for the expression session, I was going to kick up my costume idea. Because at Nationals, I decided I was going to ride... It was like expression session was like, let's just goofy free ride. We're not going to write down the runs. We're just going to go free ride. So I borrowed the chef's apron. It was red. I tied it backwards. It was a cape. And then I wore these Elvis sunglasses. I don't know. I don't know. And so at Worlds, I decided that I was going to go out with this big afro. I had these like these goggles called aqua specs that some dude at Portland gave me. They're like, Hey, these are for water skiing and they're like sunglasses and they strap on your head. I was like, probably won't, but I'll wear them to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> wear them ironically, yeah. <laughs> and I wore a Hawaiian shirt and bell bottom like polyester pants. Went all out. I did. Wow. Yeah, I look like an idiot, but whatever. I, I was just like, I'm just gonna goof around. Like that's what we're doing. Because people were so like serious in the contest scene that I was like, I'm going the other direction. Yeah. We're wakeboarding. <laughs> this is kind of goofiness and silliness. So let's to me, I want to keep it that way. Okay, so I think a couple of things to unpack there. <laughs> One of which is before Hyperlite did sign you, um, did you have any other sponsors, and did anybody else approach you? No. So that was no the first. no sponsors. But at, at in Portland, Tony Finn came up to me. Okay, and he started to like want to have a conversation, and I think that was like a little bit after Hyperlite started to talk to me. I, I don't know. It was around the same okay. time, but I was like, I want to go. I want to go with Hyperlite. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing is you're talking about the seriousness of competitive wakeboarding back then. I think there's a, a twofold thing there with water skiing and the water skiing culture was snowboarding or let's see snowboarding skiing culture. I was mm -hmm. getting myself getting ahead of myself there, but um, were wakeboarders viewed differently than the water skiers as in looked down upon in a certain way? Or was it, I mean, there had to be a little bit of pushback I'd imagine. Uh, it depends where you were. Okay. Like the, the only place that you really feel like a vibe is when you go to the masters to this day. <laughs> <laughs> In some instances. Some what do you mean by that? Well, some, some of the skiers are cool and I'm not saying they're not cool, Yeah, but, um, it just, uh, and I get it. Like you, when you're skiing, it's systematic and, and you know, like it seems like it's very different, but if you were to go and just see what really makes us up, we're really similar, but there's kind of this weird vibe. And, um, during, during, I, I can't believe I want to say this publicly, but I'm going to say it D during the wakeboarding there, the water skier, like the crowd that watches water skiing, they evacuate the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> 
I probably shouldn't say it, but they do. And it's whatever. Yeah, like, you like what you like, I and guess. You, you'll, I mean, see, you'll see a changing of, of the guard, but there's not as many people watching wakeboarding because there's not as many wakeboarders there. Yeah. Um, on the pavilion. Now, as far as the crowd on the shore, they're all still there. They love watching all the different events. Um, but there's a, a weird vibe between some of the skiers. I'm not blanket statement saying yeah, that against sure. all the skiers. Um, and I'm not saying it's for me. Like, I have a ton of skier friends. In fact, I respect all of them. But there, there's some that are just very much, you know, playful and they still have fun on the water. I'm not saying the skiers don't, but there's some that, that take it a little bit more serious. But the reason, like, I- if I look back and see why even the wakeboarders were taking it serious, like I said before, is that I think it was nerves. You okay. know, I, I think it's just, it's hard to process a lot of those things for people. You know, like, this is a stressful moment. Like, there, there's a lot of n- things that can come out and so people sometimes shut down um but for myself and i know like parks and i hung out all the time on the tour we were just goofy and playful we would go to like skate parks that were in town we would travel with our rollerblades we would travel with our skateboards like we would find the parks uh i remember one time we went to burger king and we came back from the from burger king wearing the paper crowns he went and competed in it like go look at him there's there's a shot of him uh, riding with a with a paper uh, Burger King hat on, like the, the paper crown, and he went and did like a big like back scratcher off the off the double up wearing it, and it was like the boy who would be king or something like that. <laughs> so like that that was the way that we dealt with it. It was let's just go have fun. There was even a period of time that we brought our soap shoes around. <laughs> big soap shoes guy, huh? No, I won't say big, but the the company they sent us some. You own a pair? Oh, you got, oh, you got some pair? Okay, yeah, yeah. I feel like you can eat some major crap on some soap shoes. I never yeah. used them, but we spent one night running around town, like getting on some rails. Yeah. And Shane would join us a lot. Shane, okay, yeah, having a good time on the yeah. uh, on the soap shoes. <laughs> uh, well, we're kind of on that hyperlight thing. Uh, I know it was it was interesting how you got that first pro model. Kind of run run us through how you received the news that you're getting a, a pro model board. It, it, it was interesting because I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know I was getting a pro model. Um, the first time that I, I, I was kind of taken aback was sitting at breakfast. We were in the keys shooting two videos. Um, I didn't know what we were shooting. It was just like, Hey, do you want to go down to the keys with us? And this is around, uh, fall, uh, fall of 95. So th- this is when I'm in my last semester of college. And the reason I say that is like, I'm at school. I travel down to the keys with the hyperlight team. They're shooting, uh, a video called The Boarding School that was an instructional series that Hyperlight put together. And we were also shooting Hit It. And so that was FLF's film that uh, they brought Hyperlight into it. And um, that was where I did like the Rayleigh under the bridge and mm-hmm. down in the Keys, right? So I'm at breakfast sitting with Herb O'Brien on my right. And he just, he goes, hey, what would you change about our boards? And I'm like, oh, you know, he's like, what, what do you think of them? Like, are they great? Will you change anything? And I thought, well, I don't understand why the channels follow the rail. I feel like the channels should be straight. We're, we're, even though we're turning, like the water is, is going underneath us straight. So I would just straighten out the channels at first. He goes, okay, I think we'll do that. And I'm like, really? That's how this works? <laughs> like, okay. And so this, was that 95, 96? Either way, I think it was like, yeah, it must have been because – my first board that I get in the mail, um, I'm living with Dean Lavelle, and that's a, a whole story in itself, but I, I um, get a box in the mail, and he pulls out his pro model, the Latitude. It's this blue board, and then out comes mine, the Fluid, and it says my name on the bottom. It wasn't my signature. I was like, I didn't sign that, but that's cool, and it's got these green stripes, and, and it's got this, like, green, uh, or sorry, these these three stripes down and a green band around it. I'm like, this is awesome. Like I'm getting a pro model. Like, no way this is all happening right now. And so Jeff here had the pride, um, his Canadian maple leaf on there. And, and so that was, um, I got it in the winter of 96. Yeah. That must've been 95 into 96 because it was a 97 pro model. That's wild. You just, it just shows up in the mail and it's yeah. Yours. And I, I, I feel like I saw some graphics or something like that. 
like show up and they're like, what do you think of this? And I, and I don't, but it didn't have your name on it or anything. I don't remember time. processing it. Like that. I just remember like getting it in the mail and be like, Whoa, yeah, this has happened. Like this is crazy. Okay. So you made one change to a board and now it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it worked because I was the, the short guy in the 137. Dean was the 142 and Jeff was the 147 bigger dude. Okay. Um, those early days of your pro career, you, you were traveling to boat shows on your own dime. This might be a little bit after. Um, was that pretty stressful? I know you said you had some goals in college that you agreed on with your dad. to like, hey, if we kind of hit these goals, this is something that you can keep pursuing. Rather, um. So it was around that Keys trip, and I was hanging out with Dean Lavelle because we were shooting for Hit It. We shot out at Lake Butler, um, which is not far from here, and, and uh, we shot in the Keys. And in some of our car conversations, Dean was like, you should – quit school you should ride pro I'm like Kobe Mikasich said the same thing okay so I start having these conversations with my dad like hey can I take a semester off school coming into this next spring so I would basically like from the winter all the way through the spring get ready for the next tour season so this would be my like first real season of like training for the tour and he goes you get one chance that we're going to do this and we're going to write down goals. If you don't achieve these goals, you go right back into school after that tour season. And if you do achieve it, then we'll write down goals and then see if you can do it again. And what were those early goals? Do you remember? Um, it was uh, results, you know, like you need to get like top 10 on the tour overall. You need to have like three top threes or something like that. It, but it was like some things that, you know, not just like do good on the tour, yeah. like have some real measurable goals. And, uh, and I think it was also pick up one or two new sponsors. And so it was some of these things is like, all right, I got to go and see what I can make happen. Okay. So at this time you're just on Hyperlight and they're paying you, right? No, I don't know. At, at that point when I first signed with Hyperlight, maybe. Okay. Maybe. But, but clearly not but to no. the level where you're like, okay, no. I'm done with school. Yeah. We're so it, 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 so while we were filming out on the Butler chain, Dean had just moved into this house uh, that was on Butler, but it was like kind of like a shack. It was pretty small. It was a two bedroom. Um, I mean, it, it was like crooked. The house, like if you set someone on the table, things would roll off. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and while we were shooting one day, he had to go run some errands. And so I was just going to be at the house, just hanging out for a couple hours while I waited for him to come back. And then we would go out and ride. And so I was just sitting there and, and I was like, is there anything I can do? He goes, well, when we come back, I'm going to put up some of this wood paneling on the wall. I was like, well, I can do that. Like I can do some construction. I'll figure it out. And so he came back and I had finished that project. And, uh, so he sold our other roommate. This guy's name was Lynn Teachworth. He's still a good friend of mine to this day. And he was like, Hey, Sean's going to live with us, but he's going to sleep on the back porch. Like it was a back porch, like it was a glorified back porch that had these windows that kind of like mosquitoes would still come in yeah. and the, the neighbor's light would pour in. But I had a corner that was basically the size of this area we're sitting in now that I had a dresser and a bed and that was it. And that was my, that was my zone. And uh, I learned to sleep with the covers over my head because the light from the neighbor's like lighting <laughs> would pour in and the mosquitoes would come in. But I was stoked. I was like taking a, a season off. I'm living right on the Butler chain. We had Dean's Nautique in the backyard. And uh, I had a place to live because I didn't know what I was going to do. And it worked out. And so that was uh, when we had the first X Games challenge was in that backyard. We were already going into the X Games at that point. And really? So, yeah. Okay. A um, couple of things there. I think... When does the green bug board, what, what year is that? Do you remember? Ne the next year. The next year after yeah. that. Okay. So, but after this Hyperlite deal you have, you agree, got, got to make some goals happen. <laughs> um, what were some other sponsors you picked up after Hyperlite? Because that was something on the, the list, right? Yeah. Uh, Jet Pilot. Okay. I picked them up uh, 95, 96. And so I've been with them ever since. And um, some other like sunglass sponsors and, and like a shoe sponsor or something yeah, like did that. You, you had a uh, Vans, right? Yeah. What was the, the Vans deal? Was that pretty good? You remember that? Um, yeah, it wasn't great. They, like a lot of those supplementary ones would never be like, oh, you're retiring early on this. Yeah. Like, you're stoked just on the amount of shoes that you get. And there is, there is a check in the mail. Um, but to be with Vans, yeah, I got to know Steve Van Doren, super nice guy. And 
um, that was a cool thing is like a lot of the companies that I've worked with work with a lot of other sports like Fox, you know, so getting a Ricky Carmichael and the and crossovers. Yeah. Awesome. A, lot of, a lot of crossovers. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so you're picking up some sponsors, you're making some money, get some pro model boards. Let, let's talk about that green bug. Um, cause that's a pretty iconic graphic I would say in, in wakeboarding's history. Um, that idea come from the car you had. I'm yeah. Guessing. Yeah. So I rebuilt a Volkswagen bug. Um, it was a, a 67 and the thing was kind of a train wreck. And so one day, um, I pulled it into my parents' garage and just started taking it apart. Cause I was like, what I just, there's a hole under the passenger seat like this big you drop some on the floor it's gone and if you would drive over puddles it would rain in the car just like it was just not good so i started taking it apart and then realized it was falling apart and so i completely stripped it down learned that the body comes off the chassis and learned how to weld and like totally rebuilt the thing um and so that was what i was driving in college and uh it was my first pro model the fluid that I was riding, and at the time, I was snowboarding. I was really getting into snowboarding a lot. So I actually started on the snow before I started on the water. I started on snow skis when I was like two and a half years old. My dad would steer me down the mountain. And, and uh, so did a lot of ski trips with my family in Southern California and Utah and all that. And so I got onto a snowboard when I was like 18, 19 years old. And I really just liked the feeling of, of the flow of snowboarding. And the, the current ski board that I was on, the, you know, my, my fluid wakeboard, felt a little too water skiish, And so I wanted something that had a little bit more body to it, more surface area that could kind of slow things down, give me a little bit more pop off the wake, bigger, softer landings. And so I gave a board to a buddy of mine, Steve. I said, I actually gave him two boards. I said, I want you to cut this one in half and then cut two inches out of the middle of the other one and put it in between the two. I just want that much. I want the board to be two inches wider. And he was like, I don't know if we can like, like do that. And around the same time, Rob Strherrick, uh came up with the idea to take one of Hyperlite's massive boards. They had the Vashon, Pados, and the Kamano. they were these like kind of real boxy shaped boards. But he took one of the, he took the biggest one and he cut the tip and tail off. And what that did was allowed us to, to ride a board that had way more surface area, but wasn't um, long. And so I said, that's what I'm talking about. And I feel bad because like Rob didn't get that, that board. He, I, I, he went to another company at that point. Um, but I, I was like, that's what I'm going for. That's what I want, why I wanted to insert those two inches into that board. And so the bug shape came from that. And then the bug graphic came from, you know, my, my history with the Volkswagen bug. Great board. You, do you have one of those laying around still? Or I do. All at the, you not, do. Not my original one. Okay. Not my original. Yeah. You ever pop it out and ride it? Um, I tried and it w I wrote it for the 15th anniversary board. We did like, I wrote every shape, which is a trip in itself. And I went to recreate the, the 360 off the double plank I did out at Lake Powell years ago. And I snapped it in half. And oh. I was just like, oh no, I broke it. Can't my, be going so hard on these my, old boards. My <laughs> last one was honeycomb thing snapped in half. But um, Bill Porter did, uh, worked with Hyperlite on, on this collab and they recreated the bug board graphic. And you can go see that I did like, I tried to recreate the cover on it doing the, the 720 uh, wakeboard mag cover that I did. It was my first magazine cover was where I did a heel side seven. And they show you like the sequence of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I tried to go and do that. I did a video and I was like, I'm, I'm going to get it. But I borrowed my neighbor's 210 because I was like, I'm going to do it off the similar boat. Took the like such a bad fall. And I haven't tried it since. Like a back edge or? Yeah. Ugh. Like just got ran, like so wrong, like so hard. But um, yeah, I, I, I still, that that's still for me, like one of my favorite graphics. I, I yeah. have a bunch of fun boards, but um, in that one, just like in the sport, it's like one of the harder ones to find. Graphics were different back then too. Yes. Definitely simpler, kind of cool and unique. Um, there were some unique formats back in this, you know, mid, late 90s, early 2000s of wakeboarding. Um, there was one I was watching the other day. It's called the Big Air Challenge mm -hmm. at SeaWorld. You remember that double up contest? Yeah, I had so much hair then. You had a lot of hair, and, and you had an interesting kit choice there. Yeah, and um, socks too. What was up with the tennis socks? Um, on that occasion, I think I was just being goofy. Okay. Just legit. I don't know why. Um, 
but at, like around like somewhere around that time I actually started wearing socks but I think it was deeper into the years because the bindings I felt like my feet were slipping yeah so I started wearing socks um, but I think those legit didn't have feet on them <laughs> oh, really yeah I think they just were this tube <laughs> like a compression sock just for your for your calf there yeah um, so that that format though um, was unique because it was a double up challenge but it had a extended ski pylon on the tower you remember that yeah were there a lot of contests that were kind of messing around with different formats and different for sure what were some unique ones you remember back then um i mean there were times that I, we did we would we would do the sea races because sea sponsored the tour and they're like well what are you going to do with these and we would try to go tri- do trick runs behind them and you could kind of do stuff but for some reason somebody decided we were going to race head to head so you can go look at these on like wakeboard hall of fame like where it's Parks, Darren, me, and Zane. And it was usually the four of us because we would just be stupid like and kind of like go way too fast with somebody on the back. So you're going head to head, driving, riding, going through a course. You got to hit rails and stuff like that or kickers and jump. I don't remember what it was. So that was crazy. Um, We also had one where we rode in the Anaheim Stadium pond that was behind the the stadium out there that we rode behind uh, a jet boat. I won a, a wave runner from that. Um, that was a, a goofy format. We, we flew all the way down to the Caribbean to do the board to board crossover challenge. So we would have pro snowboarders, pro wakeboarders form teams. And, uh, the time we went down to the Caribbean, it was sponsored by Jose Cuervo and they have their own Island down there. I don't think they do anymore, but they did. And, uh, it was because they wanted to have their own Olympic snowboard team. So they had to form their own country and it fell through Jose Cuervo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they bought an island, and, like, I remember I swam around the whole thing. It wasn't big, but we snorkeled. It took us a while, but we snorkeled all the way around. So we became friends with a bunch of snowboarders, and we, we went there, and the Mastercraft, I think it was, and this is nothing, like, I should, probably shouldn't say this, but, like, the boat broke. Okay. Right? And it, it, and it wasn't anything to dig on them. It was just, like, bad timing. So we rode behind a, an inflatable dinghy with a center console, like, legit outboard motor, and that was our contest. And I don't think they showed that on the TV because <laughs> it was sponsored. Um, but we rode behind an inflatable one time. Um, one time it wasn't a contest. Parks and I got flown down to Cabo to meet up with these motocross guys like Metal Militia Dudes, like Twitch and Deegan and all them. They were doing this video called Thousand Mile Jump. And we show up there, and the video producer who I talked to on the phone, I was pretty young, but... Um, he was like, yeah, we got a Malibu down there. It's going to be great. We're going to have this boat. We'll have everything lined up. We get down there, and they were just a train wreck. Like, they came in with half the RV had fallen off because they pulled into a gas station, and it, like, got stuck. And so they duct taped the thing on. So they pull in, and they're just pouring out of the RV, and it's just, like, bad. And the guy's like, we got to find a boat. And so we go down to the dock, and he find, he's, and I'm like, he doesn't have a boat. And so he gets this massive parasail boat. And so Parks and I ride behind a parasail boat. And that, I think, is in Switch. I don't know. You can see footage of us riding behind a parasail boat. Okay. Um, crazy contests that I don't think we ever rode in the super tower. Do you ever see the tower that had the sail on it? No. They had a tower that was so big that they put, it was almost like a windsurfing sail on the top because it was so tall when you would pull, the boat would lean list. so yeah. hard over. It would list so that they had the sail that would correct it. That would pull it the other way. Innovative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you've won a lot of contests. You, you won a jet ski. I didn't know that. Or a wave runner, whatever you call it. What else have you won that, uh, that's out of the ordinary, you know, cash purse? Uh, I won a truck, a Ford Ranger. Does your dad still drive that? He still drives it. He won't get rid of it. Well, it still runs. Why get rid of it? Yeah, well, I think he's changed the engine in it. Oh, like, okay. got a paint job. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Anything else that? Um. Yeah, I mean. I don't know all, all sorts of crazy trophies. And I came back from Russia with this massive cup and I was like, I'm not going to leave it. Like so a Stanley I, cup kind of thing. Yeah. Like massive. <laughs> the thing like off the ground, it is probably <laughs> this big. <laughs> it felt that way. Um, yeah. Some crazy stuff. All right. So we're, we're still kind of in the, the late nineties, early two thousands. I think it's a good time to talk about some video parts. So we, we touched on a little bit earlier of, of some, some videos you were in. Um, switch 22. There's not, uh, there's nothing 
specific trick wise I want to get into in that, but something about kind of the wakeboard culture back then. In those early days, it seems like when you watch a video, maybe half the people are wearing a vest half the time, half the time they're not. I'm just kind of fascinated by what was the decision back then to either wear one or not wear one? Was it surf motivated, kind of kooky if you did wear one or how was it viewed back then? You know, I, I think it just wasn't thought about as much. Okay. For me, it, I, I didn't think about it. Like, I just found a bunch of VHS stuff where I was riding without a life jacket. And I don't think I was like, oh, I'm going to be cool without a life jacket. I think it was just, I, I really don't know. Yeah, I, I can't put a finger on it. Um, but we definitely crossed the line. We're like, that's not smart. Like, we're going really fast. And this is pretty dangerous. Yeah, cause it, I mean, maybe it originated from trick skiing because trick skiers don't wear them because yeah. they're going slow, close to the boat. But I, I was just curious because it's it's you're watching a video and one shot someone's wearing a Coast Guard proof vest. Next time someone's wearing a rash guard. Next time someone's you know bare yeah. chested. Yeah, so. yeah, me included. Yeah. yeah. So wear your vest. Um, all or nothing. Ford sliding through some fire on a rail. Is that uh? You remember that clip? Yeah. Was yeah. that your idea or? Um, I think so. That was like Ron, like. Uh, Ron Seidenglanz, um, awesome guy, very creative. And so we, he, almost all the time when he was shooting these videos, he would stay at my house. And so we would just brainstorm on different goofy ideas. And, and, uh, so yeah, that was out of the projects at the time. Okay. Um, and yeah, we were doing this and I, I, I think it was kind of impromptu. Well, now let's light the rail on fire. <laughs> That's probably how most... <laughs> Most shots like that get, <laughs> get yeah. happen. Um, thoughts on bringing the headband back. You had a, you're rocking a white headband in uh, quite a few of those it's shots. It's really funny because there's so many times, like board pants, that I wear it one time, and then it's, it seems like that's what I do. But I just, I think that was one. That was like, a good look. The headband look, I think, was a good look, though. I think, I mean, it makes sense, too. Keep the water out of your eyes. Right. Right? So, right. like the goggles. The goggles make sense, too. You know? Okay. I'll <laughs> consider it. Um, you had a clip. It was a wake skate pull jam to board slide. And it was a pretty heavy rail, especially considering you're on a wake skate. I don't know if you remember this clip or not. It seems like it might have taken quite a few tries. Do you remember that clip? What video? Um, still in all or nothing. On the lake? Or on in the, the lake. Ditch? On the lake. Yeah, the, the ditch ones were separate on the lake. It was it was pretty heavy. Yeah. I'll put the clip in for those. Yeah, it's okay if you don't remember it, but I, uh, you had a lot of clips. I, I wake skated for a bit. Like, I was into it for a while. Well, yeah, why is that? I, I liked it. Um, and I don't know. Like, I, 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 I just growing up skateboarding, growing up surfing, I just like kind of like the freedom of it. Um, and I, I think I got a pretty big fire lit underneath me when we had a wake skate party at my house. And everybody came over. And Byerly was there. And nobody had done a three, like wake to wake. And I tried it. It took me a few tries and I made it. And I think I was the first one to do a wake to wake three. Like this is like 98, I think. I don't know. But at that point I was like, oh man, I could like get pretty good at this. Like I was enjoying the feeling and you get like, like some props from Byerly. Yeah, that's enough to get you going, right? right. <laughs> um, but then I had my worst injury on the wake skate. And okay, let's run through that injury. Uh, 2004, I'd won the worlds in 2003 and from the podium, um, I announced like, Hey, I'm taking next year off. Somebody had told me like Kelly Slater didn't compete for a year. And I'm like, I'm no Kelly Slater, but maybe I can take a year off and not compete. I competed. I felt like forever. Yeah. I had been competing since 95 and went to all the way straight to Oh three. I thought I'd ride professionally for like five years. And so when I, you started. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I started at 19 and I thought I was going to make it to mid twenties and made it to mid twenties. I thought, okay, maybe 30. Right. So at this point I'm like, okay, I'm going to take next year off. I'm just, people thought I said I retired, but they said it on the broadcast. I think in one of those contests, they're like, and Sean Murray's retiring. Oh, well, they I'm, did. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so <laughs> well, retiring for a year, I guess like Tom Brady, right? <laughs> yeah, but I, I legit was just like, you know, I'm just not going to compete next year. And so while everybody was out touring around, uh, I was wake skating at home one day. And um, my buddy Aaron, um, and he has a twin brother, Brent. They were 12 years old at the time, had never driven a boat. I was like, I'll show you how to drive a boat. 
I go out and I say just one more and we'll head back home. I don't say just one more, right? So I do a wake to wake jump. Simple. Everything's fine. I land and I think my back foot's on, but it's not. And so what happens is my foot goes into the water, wake skates running, my front foot stays on, my back leg is the anchor, and rather than stretching at the groin, I'm ready to stand, and so my knee dislocates sideways, and so my left leg at the knee bends to the left, not the, the wrong direction, not, not backwards, but it goes to the side to where it's now hanging off to my left. And I'm tumbling through the water, and I, it felt like a gunshot in my leg. And I just feel my leg flopping around. And as I'm like coming to a stop, I grab my leg on the side and I just shake it and I throw it back into place. And I'm like, oh, what just happened? They come around. I'm just writhing in pain. And I'm just like, oh, this is not good. Keep in mind, they don't know how to drive a boat. They're driving circles around me, just like slowly. And I'm just like, just, just stop the boat. And I told his brother, get in and just pull me into the boat. He gets in. He's about drowning trying to pull me in. And so I'm like, forget it. Let me just get myself in. I get on the back of the boat. I pulling into the dock. I go just hit the dock and get us there. We go in. I pack my leg in ice. I called Danny Harf and uh, he's in Canada at a tour stop. And I go, Danny, when, when you blew your knee, cause he had just done his knee like a little while ago, when you blew your knee, did you have to put your leg back into place? And he goes, and he goes, no. And he laughs I'm like, oh, this is bad then. So I call my buddy who's a doctor, and he says, as long as you're getting blood to your toe, because you can sever your femoral artery and you can bleed out. He goes, just check your, your toe. I didn't even go to the ER. I was like, what are they going to do? Yep, you blew it. Now you need to have surgery. So I knew I just needed an MRI. I got it, the MRI. ACL, MCL, PCL, meniscus. The whole gamut. The whole thing. And when they went in, the doctor didn't realize that I did my ACL and uh, as well as my PCL. And so he had to use my patellar tendon. I, for a month, I felt like I had the flu. My body, looking back, uh, was rejecting the, 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 the graft. So I had cadaver grafts. I had part of my graft. Like, and to this day, my, my leg doesn't bend past like 120 degrees. <laughs> like it's not good. But it hasn't stopped me. But I don't wake skate. <laughs> I was going to say, do you still wake skate? So I, I was like, a couple years after that, I was like, you know, I'm not going to let this stop me. I was doing just like, uh, trying a, a back bag or something just out in the flats and I fell and when I came up the wake skate goes Doof, and it just split me wide open I was like I'm done wake skating it, it has something against you it's I'm, not meant to be I'm done <laughs> I, don't, I don't wake skate anymore <laughs> um, before we dive into the rest of that injury because I know that's that's probably a big point in your life that massive injury um, let's finish up with some video parts here uh, Mayday Kind of an iconic wakeboard film. A lot of these old ones are. Um, how did that opportunity come about to be in Mayday? You know, um, I, I didn't know at the time. I thought it was like, hey, if you get good and like, you know, you can get an invite to these trips. It was Hyperlight sponsoring the video and they send riders. And so I was the one that got sent on that trip. Uh, the reason it was called Mayday is because while we were out there, we got a Mayday call. And there is this family that their boat, their houseboat, um, there's a massive storm came in. We just experienced one when I was there a couple weeks ago. And it's crazy. Like, crazy winds, they will knock houseboats over. Like, it's, it can be This is Lake Powell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, out of Lake Powell. And uh, ripped this houseboat off the shore. We didn't know. We just, we hear this Mayday call. Come to find out their um, anchor lines that, that were tied to the shore got wrapped in the prop as they were trying to adjust. So they were dead in the water, got ripped off the shore. This lady was on the shore in a swimsuit and when we finally got to her, we were out with just a spotlight and we're looking for her and we see her on the shoreline just as it's pitch black dark and she's like running up and down the beach trying to stay warm. And we get her on the boat, we take her over <clears throat> and they were just getting the, the, the prop undone. Out. They were about to hit this other far, far wall. They had all of this on film and they lost the film. Bummer. Yes. Wow. Okay. I that, didn't know the, the story behind that. That's why it was called Mayday. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, for th yeah, for those who don't know, Lake Powell's in a desert, so it can get really hot during the day, but frigid cold at night, cold enough that yes. I imagine you probably wouldn't make it some nights. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, especially when we were there. And um, but for that for that video, some pretty big things happened. Um, and uh, come to find out, Thomas Harrell 
Randy Harris, not super fond of me. Um, just, I, I was the water skier, even though I wasn't, uh, but, uh, they just, I think also coming from Hyperlight, they just weren't super pumped, you know, on that cause it was a water ski company. Um, but, uh, Tom is a good guy this, to this day, you know, friend of mine, um, Randy as well. But on that trip, I felt pretty unwanted. Like, really? Ju- yeah. Like, cause they were just like, and some of you shouldn't even be here. And like, yeah, just like. Core, so, core wakeboarding strikes again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was to like where I felt it. And I was like, this sucks. Yeah. You know, this sucks. But I became good friends with Chase Hebner and we hung out a lot and, uh, we, we would kind of do our own thing. Um, at, at times there and and so at one point that was when Thomas happened to be like we would go out in groups with the filmers so there were two filmers there or three filmers and we would go out and we would shoot for the morning or the evening and we were out in the evening and somehow I got paired up with Thomas and I was like this is weird but whatever you know we just they cycle through people and he was driving me double ups and I was trying heel nines Heel nine hadn't been done. Uh, toe nine hadn't been done at the time. Hmm. Um, so n- nines hadn't been done. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty consistent on sevens. I can do them it's still hard, but I can do them. And I'm going to try some nines. And I was falling on them. And every time Thomas would come back around to pick me up, he would chirp something. Hey, why don't you just try the Tweety Bird instead? That was like an air word. Hey, why don't you do an egg roll? That's an air scarecrow. Like, just like beacon me the whole I time. I want you to those tricksky tricks, man. Yeah, <laughs> just do like your goofy little right. Like, he just kept like, and, it, and at one point, like, I, I'm like starting, my blood's starting to boil. And uh, so he says something. The photo boot that's parked over off to our left, they're changing the, the, the camera, the, the film. They have to literally go into, a, into this hood, this big black cover because they're it's real film and so they would put in these hundred foot rolls of film and it took a a little bit of time and at that point I was so mad at Thomas I just said just go and and I give Thomas the finger and I think I said some dirty words and I said some things to him that (laughs) he shouldn't have but he was really firing you up he was really firing me up yeah and Normally at that point, like my, my riding is done. I'm not the kind of guys be like, oh, I'm going to get fired up and ride. No, like I'm, I'm out there for a fun, good vibe. And this is going the other way. And so I don't even want to wait for them to change the camera. I'm just mad at him driving, but I still need him to drive. And he goes and does a great double up. And I go and I land the heel nine. And when I land it, I just gave him the bird. <laughs> I just threw it hard at the boat and I landed it and he, he was pumped. And I mean, how can you not be right? Like, yeah. it's, I mean, I feel, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there, but maybe a little bit of respect earned in the sense if you kind of felt unwanted and then he pushes you, pushes you, pushes you. And then you're finally like, you know what? Screw it. Yeah. I'm going to go land an MBD right now. Yeah. And he did. So <laughs> that's a good story. Um, at the end of that part or your part in that, that video, you said, as soon as wakeboarding stops being fun, I'm taking a hike. So could you say that wakeboarding is the most fun thing to do since you're still sitting here doing it? It really is. Um, I, I'm going to also say like foiling right now is really fun because it's a whole new adventure. It's not, it's not what we, be, it's not like wake surfing is to wakeboarding or water skiing. It's flying in the water and it's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. But as far as like the fun that can be had out on the boat with your family, with your friends, whatever you're riding, yeah, it's it's too easy to have a good time. You know, of course you can have bad moments or bad days, frustrating moments or whatever, but you're teed up for such a good, fun social atmosphere. Yeah. So, yeah, I just went out with my family last night, and I'm, I'll am i be out. I don't know if I'll get home tonight, but uh, I'll be out there tomorrow. Wakeboarding? Yeah, probably. I wakeboarded today. How, how often do you wakeboard these days? It depends. It depends. Yeah. Um but you know what I've been doing lately is uh, if I'm not like filming a part or something like that or trying to, you know, get some big tricks done, <clears throat> I'll bring my rope in to probably like 55. Today I rode 60 feet and put the speed at about 19.8 with zero ballast in the boat. Now, granted, this is a Paragon. That's like 
seventy four hundred pounds. Yeah, but the the physics of slowing down and just dropping the speed that's the goal. Like bring the speed down. the The rhythm slows down. The impact slows down. The risk is down. It's a really fun way just to kind of get your feet and, and things underneath you. Um, I went and played ice hockey yesterday with with Bob Sovin, and so my legs were a little tired. I was like, I don't want to ride a big wake today. I want to take it easy. So that's what I did. Yeah, and with the advent of the bigger boards, you you can drop that speed down and probably not really notice a difference if you were riding in the mid two thousands with some smaller boards and smaller wakes. So drop that speed down, pull that rope in a little bit. Yeah, it's for a real, lot of fun. like for real. Like yeah. you can actually get down to sixteen miles an hour if you go short enough. I have a rope that goes down to forty five feet, so you can actually get pretty slow and still do a lot of fun yeah. stuff. There's no rules, so do whatever you want. Uh, Twelve honkies. Yeah. Speaking of iconic wakeboard, is that movies. offensive? I saw that literally, no joke. I it's sitting. I'm I'm organizing a bunch of my office, and VHS tape is sitting there, and there's all these six pack and switch switch twenty two and twelve honkies. I'm like, is that offensive now to people? I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not offended by it. I, it's so long ago. It I comes. Don't know. It comes from Twelve Monkeys. It was a Bruce Willis Brad Pitt film. That's, that's like the spoof it. of it, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not the basis, but that's the name. Yeah, spoofed off the Twelve Monkeys. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's worth getting all getting upset about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the funniest scenes from any wakeboard movie I've ever seen um, is when you get picked up by Zach Morris. Who is Mark Paul? I don't know how to say his last name. Goss, Gossler. 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 Okay, yeah. so it's easier to say than it looks. Um, from Saved by the Bell, which is a super popular TV show back yeah. in the day. Um, how did he get involved in this movie? Do you do you know the origin of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he came and stayed at my house. Okay. So <laughs> it's funny, man. It's crazy when we start talking about all these stories. Yeah, my life is crazy. Um, yeah, Zach Morris. I watched Saved by the Bell. AC Slater, Screech, Jesse, like all that stuff. Um, so we had a lot of crossover in the moto world. And so we would do some contests where we would go out to California and we would ride moto with some of these guys. And, uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Shane Trittler. Uh, I met him through, I think Kobe, uh, Kobe's big into moto and, um, Shane is friends with Mark Paul Gossler and Mark Paul was into wakeboarding. And so he's like, hey, we're going out to Sean Murray's house. You want to go? So came out. He was there. At the time, like my my house, I w- always had like roommates, so many roommates. Shannon Bass, Kobe Mikasic, Chris Bischoff, Andrew Atkinson, a- Andy Lazarus, like big list, Jerry Nunn, like all these people that lived in my house. And at one point, every room was full. And it was when he showed up and he slept up on, <laughs> he slept like in this hallway balcony that I have at my house. I felt pretty bad. And my, 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 my friends were there and they're like, Mark Paul, Zach Morris is sleeping upstairs right now. <laughs> like it was, it was kind of funny, but, um, he was, he's pretty good at wakeboarding. He's a really good athlete. Is he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's a really good athlete. Um, and, uh, and so we were shooting 12 honkies at the time and they pitched him on the, Hey, will you go do this? And I don't, I didn't know what they were doing because I wasn't in the car with him because it's him and the cameraman and then me and the cameraman. And so they're just getting me to do these reactions like, okay, now you'd be like, Oh, and now you'd be like, Oh, like, and give me all these different reactions. So you <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't know what the story was. That makes it even better. Yeah. And so I didn't know what it was until we went to the premiere. And back then we would have premieres like Ron would have movie premieres in theaters And it would normally coincide with us being at like the X games. And so we'd be in San Francisco at this, you know, big movie theater. And we went in there and I remember watching this and I'm like, that's how that turned out. This Mark Paul scene. He's like, Hey, you're that guy. And I'm like, "Eh." he's like, I knew it. And I was like, "Eh." you're Parks Bonifay. I'm like, "Eh." (laughs) I'm like, Oh, that's why they wanted those reactions from me. That's funny. Oh, that scene is, that scene is too good. He's a really good actor. And then yeah. that, was a, that was a great scene. That was Rob Straherick's Porsche. Was it? It wasn't? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a nice car. Yeah. The license plate legit said extreme. <laughs> that wasn't custom for the movie. It no. was. It legit it says. It legit. Well, things were extreme back then. Yeah, obviously. Very extreme. Um, I, I think it's a good time to talk about that injury you did have to your knee. Because um, it seems like, to me, that's maybe a big turning point in who you are and your career um, and your faith specifically. So I know there's a couple of videos up that are called my story 
and it's kind of you running through that part of your life. So I don't know if you want to just start, you know, right after the injury and kind of where you were at in life at that point. Yeah. So, so growing up, like I was always going to a youth group and church on Sunday and summer camps and all sorts of stuff, always involved in church. And when we went to, uh, when I moved down to Florida, um, being at a ski school in the middle of nowhere, I wasn't going to church. And then, uh, then we started going, then I went to college and I was, I would go to like a chapel there. And, um, but then when we started traveling on the tour, that was when we started bringing our own kind of church service to the tour stops. So I'd bring a guitar, like just fart around playing on the guitar and share a message or somebody else would share a message. And then Emily Copeland, her parents started getting involved and they started really making it organized because it was really just Jerry Nunn and I because he, he was my roommate and so we just started bringing it along. At the same time, I, I, I still had like the exposure to a lot of these other opportunities, whether people are going out after a tour stop or you're out on a team trip and you could go to these different places where some partying was happening and nothing crazy, but you could find the party. You actually had to make effort to not find the party. And so at times I found myself like dipping my foot in the party pool. And, but I, you still had my other foot in the church pool. And so it was this, this point where I just felt myself in this place where it was like, all right, you know, God, I, I, I started to question God's existence. I started getting in, into these things and I, and I know that he's not afraid of questions. But I started going like, God, I, like, are you really there? Like, how could you have the world in the place that it is and people and all of these bad things happening? And, and uh, so I, I was wrestling with like a lot of different things in my head while I was still foot in the party pool, still foot in the church pool. And at one time, uh, at one point, um, a buddy of mine who I, I loosely knew at church, he goes, hey, bring your guitar into my office. I want to play. And if you ever play music, like we started out today, if you play music, Anytime you play with somebody else, it's super fun. So when this guy who's the worship leader invites you in, I was like, yeah, I don't think it's really going to go anywhere, but I'd love to learn something from him. But he goes, hey, that was fun. Let's show up uh, or show up on Thursday for practice. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. So uh, he's like, no, just show up. Just come check it out. And so it, he said, bring your guitar, but just come check it out. So I'm like, I'm just going to sit back. And they had a spot on stage for me. I'm like, oh, you guys are tricking me. And so, <laughs> so I found myself up on stage and so he's like, all right, we'll play Sunday. So I was like, okay. So I started playing, uh, in this little side room they called the cafe. And so I, I was playing music and still like, I, I wasn't going crazy, but at the same time, I still had a foot in that party pool. And, uh, at one Sunday, it, it wasn't anything necessarily that, that the, the, the pastor shared but it was God speaking to me because I went and played music and then I sat down just to listen to a message and, and I felt God speaking to my heart saying like, how can you be doing these things while you're leading these other people? And not only that, like you're starting to mess with some other people's walk with me because of how you're living in this party pool. So you're saying one thing, you're doing a different. So it's not just messing with you, you're messing with other people. And so it's like, all right, around that time, maybe I got my phone falling. Around that, yeah. <laughs> uh, around that time, um, I remember just like having a moment in my yard, just laying down in in the grass, going, just like, God, are you even there? You know, do you exist? And he started just showing me things in creation and, and, and I, I'll go and speak on this in places. And so this isn't me trying to convince other people to like, and this is why you believe in God for me. This is what it is, is I was laying there and, and he was saying like, do you feel how comfortable you are on this planet moving through space at a really fast speed at just the right distance from the sun so that you're not freezing and you're not burning up. It's very comfortable. It's like, yeah. And then, pretty crazy just just that and then do you see those trees that are breathing out oxygen that are breathing in your carbon dioxide there's just this like symbiotic relationship just between us and plant life and like that's pretty unique that's cool and just the fact that you can see those things when i started process like human sight that's crazy 
to me, like that we have holes in our head that have this organ that can absorb light and show us what's happening around us. That's a phenomenal thing. Like, and people can talk about evolution, but how can you try so hard to see something, to sense something and then create such a complex thing? To me, I was like, I, it, it's, it's too perfect. It's too crazy. All of these things. And so that's when I was like, okay, God, you are like, to me, you're there. Are you choosing to speak to us? Like, are you choosing to speak to me? And, and that's through his word, the Bible. And so when I was sitting there wrestling through these things at that church service, I decided I'm going to go home. I'm going to read the Bible front to back. That's big. I don't, I don't read books that much. <laughs> like I barely read the required reading in high school. Okay. <laughs> like if I find a good book, like I read the hunger games, that was good. Okay. Um, but people are like, Hey, you should read this book. I'm like, probably not going to get to it. I'll read the back cover. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> so for me to go through and read the entire Bible, like that, that was a big thing. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it in an attainable pace. And so I think I was like, I'm going to do five pages a day. And it, it took me a couple of years to get through it. Um, I also said, you know what, I'm going to walk away from these things. Okay. So I think it was February 2004. You said, I'm going to walk away from these things. Yeah. What are, what are, what are these things? What, what is that? That was, I was smoking weed. That was a big part of it. Yeah. But it wasn't like a ton out there. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't all the time. Um, but it was, it was there. Um, and so it was something like I, I would do it in select groups and things like that because I didn't really I, I knew that wouldn't be good to do publicly. Um, but it was something I was like, you know what? No matter how I feel about it, I know how other people feel about it. I can't be doing that. Yeah. But especially back then, it's that's 20, 30 years ago. It's a lot different. Yes. You know, people's view on it now. Yeah. So that's a, that, that was something for me that I was like, I'm going to walk away from that. Um, and those, those things really just shaped a perspective in me that really shifted to where I knew I was going to meet God in the morning, to read his word, to, to pray, to have that anchor point for myself, really started to shape up like what is really important in this life? Like, and what are, what are we doing? And so that was like, wow, this is a, a pretty big shift. And I, and I like it because Previous to that, I, it, it, it was almost like this paradigm shift of if you get into religion, fun's gone, right? But the more that I've unpacked in, the, in this, I realize like it's actually the other way around. It's because the reason God has like shown us historically in the Bible, there's all of these stories so I've since read through the thing like six times. I get to the end, I just start over. Today I was, I'm in Judges, um, Old Testament stuff. And, uh, but what we learned is that when, when we walk away from, from what God says, like if you go about life in this way, things can be better. And if you do this, like you're going you're, you're gonna to come across tough times, but here's how to navigate through this. Because the world is telling us like, go this way, it's fun. Go, go down this road. You're going you're gonna to have a good time. This is how you can be successful. Do this. Generally, if you want to like, have a better outcome, go against culture these days. Like They're really trying to pull us down a, a, a pretty bad path a lot of times. Not everything, but reading the, reading the Bible can definitely give you a better perspective of, yeah. of how to stand. Life's right full of a lot of short-sighted pleasures that, you know, not, I, I'm not trying to get preachy or anything or whatever. People can listen and think what they want. Um, but it's it's easy to get lost, especially nowadays, in some, some bad habits and some bad bad times can come, mm. come upon you without even realizing it. So it's whatever it is to stay grounded, I think, is very important in somebody's life. I, I think the biggest thing for me that one of the biggest takeaways and that I have to continually come back to is that there is so much noise out there, visual, auditory, all these sensory things that are just trying to like, I feel like distract us and take us away from, from God's kind of quiet voice at times. And those, those things are like always like if try to sit still for two minutes and do nothing, you're going to pick up your phone. 
do it with your friends. I do it sometimes. I just did it with my, with my, with my kids and their friends. I was like, okay, hey, we're all just going to sit here for two minutes, set a timer. Nobody do anything. Nobody say anything. Feels like an eternity. It's just because we are so used to just filling ourselves with noise from other people. Just these things are just bombarding Constant us simulation. all yeah. the time, all the time. So it's, I, I encourage people like just sit and be still watch where your brain can like really take you, especially if you go, Hey God, are you trying to tell me something? Okay. What, what age was this around? Cause it was February, 2004. You're born in 76. So quick math, 28, 28. So that's, I mean, a bit late in life, not late in life. There's no earlier <laughs> late in life, but 28 is a big, you know, that's kind of late for someone to make a big change in their yeah. lifestyle and, and stuff. Um, I do want to talk about something before this later years. Um, wakeboarding unleashed. I'm really excited about this one. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just run it from the top. How did this opportunity come about? Oh man. Um, you want the real story? I want, yeah, I want it all. Wow. So I had this dog that would wakeboard with me once in a while. And I, and never would I take this dog to OWC, but once in a, once in a while I did somehow I found myself wakeboarding behind the boat at OWC with my dog. I didn't think anything was going to come of it, but this guy comes up to me in the parking lot afterward and inter introduces himself as one of the guys from Activision. And he goes, I heard about who you are, but, and I know there's other people in the sport, but how you're riding with your dog caught my eye. I want to talk to you and I want you to, I want, I want to fly you up to Minnesota to meet everybody from Activision value is what it was called. I was like, okay. And then I start to like put two and two together. Like this is a video game thing. So they fly me. Uh, I, I go and I uh, meet one of the guys. He's here in Orlando. His name is Danny. Um, uh, uh, Danny Hammond. Go to his house for like this little kind of get to getting to know you party. He gives me an electric guitar. Like, just go like, oh, I play guitar. I don't play electric guitar. Like he gave me his guitar and, and uh, just really nice guy. And they fly me up to Minneapolis, I think. And come to find out the video game that they're working on is for the PC. So at this point, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was massive. And so I was like, well, that's still kind of cool. It's going to be for the computer, you know, whatever. That's cool. And so they're going to work on this. He's like, this is going to be huge. And I'm like, all right, whatever. And it gets farther down the road. And then it gets elevated to PS2 and Xbox. I'm like, oh, this is big time. Now, Everybody had one back then. Yes. And now, and I, I like, I, I played the first video games before Nintendo. I played Atari. We Talking we, Pong. Yeah. We built our first Pong unit. Okay. So you came in a kit, you built it. I played all the Marios. I played... I used to go to the arcade as a kid. So I was a gamer like uh, as a kid. So now I'm like, no way this is happening. So they fly me up to, um, to that. Now they fly me to California and I go to the Activision. This is not Activision value. Now it's Activision. And now I'm at like, this is where it's really happening. And so they're like, Hey, so here's the map. And they show it to me. We've got Tony Hawk's pro skater, but we also have Kelly Slater's pro surfer. Sean Palmer's pro snowboarder, Travis Pastrana's moto, Matt Hoffman BMX, and Sean Murray's pro wakeboard. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is crazy. So we start going down this road, and uh, they start developing the game. I go to this this convention called E3. It's like this massive. It's like this the, a convention on steroids because it's it's where all the video games are premiered for the year. And we go there, and they have this whole booth set up. And I remember that's where I uh, hung out with Tony, Tony Hawk for the second time. That's a actually third time. The first two are funny stories, but hung out with with Tony uh, there. Played him at his video game, beat him in his own video game, <laughs> um, and met Hoffman. Uh, hung out with Sean Palmer, nice guy. Like he and I got along. Uh, Bucky Lassick was there. Kelly Slater was there. Sean White was really young. Hung out with him a bit. Huge names we're talking right now. Yeah. And I'm. they had a half pipe in their booth that Sean White is skating. Tony Hawk is skating. They had a bunch of other skaters there. They had that. They were working on an and one game. 
Mm. You know, the basketball guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I was playing hoops with those guys. And I, I showed him this like trick move that I act like I'm going to drop kick the ball. And the guy does this and I go around him and, and he was like, that's good. I'm going to use that. <laughs> so I'm sitting at this autograph table where I'm down on the end and I'm looking at Tony, Matt, Kelly, Sean Palmer, Travis Pastrana, me. And I think Sean White, they had him at the table as well. I'm like, I don't belong here. Like, this is crazy. And so then... I, I don't know if it was that trip or then another one. They brought me back to L.A. for like this launch party where they got me three hotel rooms at the end of this hallway. Like they're all adjoining. I'm like, I, I was like, you guys know you got me three hotel rooms? They're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what do you think's going to, like, do people go this hard? <laughs> you need like three <laughs> hotel rooms? I So I stayed there three nights, so I slept in each room one night. Oh, why not? Yeah, <laughs> why not? Um but amongst all of that, like it was taking a really long time to develop it because they came out to Florida and they, they took pictures of us standing like, and they created these like wire frames of us of, of how to, you know, manipulate us because they couldn't create what they call mocap motion capture where they put like the sensors look like ping pong balls on your body and, and create the moves. They had to create a wire frame of us. And for every trick they had to frame by frame manipulate those tricks. Like stop motion. Yes. Like everything. So yeah. it took forever. The other thing was, is it was the first game to really have high def water, like real water. Because water in video games, this is 2000, right? 2000, 2001, around there. <clears throat> water just really hadn't like been delved into in this way. Um, and so it took them a while to develop it. And I went out to the company, it was called Shaba. They were a, a video game developing company that they were so big that they had purchased a shutdown school in on the outskirts of San Francisco. And so they were occupying this whole school to like build games and they were doing my game. And uh, it's in one of my board graphics. Like you can see it says Shaba Entertainment. Mm. And there's a bunch of like subliminal things in a lot of my board yeah. graphics and that's one of them. And so as they're developing it, it's taking a long time to develop it. Kelly Slater's game, um, fun game, not that great at gameplay. I'm a gamer. Um, went out into their distribution channels. It did not do well. And where it really didn't do well was Walmart. And Walmart is one of the biggest game sellers in, in the world. And when Walmart had an Activision game that dealt with water tanked, they said, we will not do another water game from you guys. And what's coming back to us from these gamer studies is that you guys are just taking Tony Hawk's engine. That's what the game is built upon. You're taking that engine and you are just putting all these other sports into it, BMX and moto. But the whiteboard game had to, it was a whole new gameplay. They were not using the same engine. Like it was all new stuff. But Walmart didn't matter to them they go you sean murray's pro wakeboarder not taking it when that report went out that put everyone just in a big standoff they're like we're not gonna because they 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 were the leader and so all the buyers they know each other and so all of these orders either got canceled or cut down to 50 percent. and so what happened was it barely made it out the door compared to what it was supposed to and so Best Buy kind of carried it, Target kind of carried it, EB Games, GameStop, some of these places kind of carried it, but it wasn't nearly to, to the extent that it was supposed to, all because it just took a little bit extra too long to, to come out. So what happened during that is they tried to revamp the, the feeling of it by changing the name from Sean Murray's Pro Wakeboard to like, people are not buying these things. Okay, I was going to ask where the name came from. So they gave me this list of names. One of them was Wake Blast. Not good, right? That sounded like a cereal. I go, guys, that sounds like a cereal. But that was like one of the top contenders, like compared to what the- They had a power ranked or whatever. Yeah. And, and so I was like, Wakeboarding Unleashed, that one seems a lot better. So that's what they ended up going with. Um, and- that's why I just did not get out and why they will not. I think they spend like eight million bucks developing that game. 
Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get that. But How much you get? <laughs> I can't say, but it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was probably a pretty penny, though, right? Yeah. What well, is a million bucks, though? Okay. Not from that. Under a million. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you play the game, did you play as yourself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, have to, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to like go and select like Darren or Parks or something. I mean, who were the, who were the, it was six, right? Yeah. In an original, who were yeah. they? Yeah. So, uh, myself, Darren, Parks, uh, Kobe Mikasich, Colin Wright, Dallas Friday, Tara Hamilton. Okay. So seven? Seven. Seven, six, in addition to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Was there a game in the works that you heard of at the same time that Parks Bonifay might have been? Byerly. By- it was Byerly. Yeah. Okay. But there was a game that was being worked on with him as well. Yeah. That never came out. Yeah. And I, I don't recall seeing it. I might have seen a little bit of the, the the graphics from it. But yeah, I think because of what happened with with that Activision game, how things went shook out, they're just yeah. like, we're not going to go down that road. Kelly Slater's game having a domino effect here on the uh, water sports video game industry. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's like, don't get me wrong. I love surfing, love video games, but playing a surfing game, it's there's just, not much to it. There, yeah, the the there's, there's no rails to grind, no wake to jump. I mean, the wake was huge and unleashed. It's massive. Yeah, yeah. there's <laughs> a. Do you know there's a jet board that you can unlock in there? I think I, I was watching on YouTube. I never unlocked that when I was playing it as a kid. I was I strictly only rode one map. I remember it. Um, but no, I never unlocked the the jet board. What map did you ride? Uh, I think it was Powell with all the with the rails on the side of the yeah. yeah that's so too good. In, in going through all my stuff that I I just told you about like VHS tapes, I have a PlayStation instead of saying PS2 on the top, it says Test, and I can play burned games on it because they would send me burned games, and I I found so they would just have me play it, and I would just play it for hours and hours, and uh, to find glitches and and different things in it on Powell. You could on one of the games that I have, you could ride through a wall, like a big rock wall and then get out into this open water and it was endless water. So it was like, you're going out into the ocean and just keep going. It was infinity water behind the boat still. Yeah. Oh, endless, endless wake pass. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. It's cool. <laughs> um, so did you give a lot of feedback in that game? Um, like I know you said they flew down, they put the dots on you and to do the stop motion and stuff, but well, what they, they didn't put the dots on us. They didn't put the dots on yeah. you. They just did the wire, the wire framing or whatever. Yeah. Did yeah. they do that of you or just of, I guess it didn't matter if it was. Uh, they did. All, so what they did was they, they created a wire frame person. Okay. And then they took, uh, they, they had this like swivel table that we stood on and we would just stand there like this and they would take photos of us. And so they would then wrap those photos onto the wire. Frame. Okay. But it was you yourself that they yeah. did. Okay, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, other feedback, I mean, yeah, what like how yeah. involved was the process of you, like trick wise and yeah, a lot. all that stuff. Yeah, was there was there was quite a bit. Very involved. Yeah, the okay. cool thing was is there were some tricks that I saw my character in the game do, and then I was like, oh, I want to try that on the water, and so like I learned tricks from the game. A little inspiration. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Yeah, um, we got a Patreon question here from Garrett Cortez. Uh, if you guys want to subscribe to the Patreon, that'd be awesome. You can get you can submit some questions here for the guests that I'm having on. Um, you're making wakeboarding unleashed 2023, which six riders or seven now, I guess, are you putting on? Wow. That's pressure. That's yeah. pressure. Um, current riders. Um, I wouldn't say it has to be current. No. Cause if a Tony Hawk came game out right now, you'd put Tony Hawk on it. Right. So yeah, there, the thing is, I mean, there's so many riders that I could say, I like that guy's style. I like that guy's style. I liked his style, whatever. Um, all time best to me, Keith Lyman. Okay. Like, to me, no brainer. We're listing off seven right now, so that's one. Yeah. Um, I would also say, like, probably Danny Harf. Um, I mean, if I didn't say Rusty, it'd be weird. Okay. Rusty? Yeah. Uh, any new names? Trevor Young Maurer. Cats. Trevor Maurer. Okay. That's one, two, three, four. You got three oh more. Oh, my goodness gracious. You got to put Megan in there, right? Megan yeah, Ethel? Megan Ethel? Yeah. Yeah. Or I, I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I mean. Yeah. Um, I mean, there. I, I think there's some that. I mean, yeah, she domi- she dominates. There's also, I mean, if you have to, if you have to choose a girl, there's. Oh man, I, I'm it's pressure. Let me let me 
pass on on the girls right okay. now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tyler Heim, really good okay. style. I like that one. Get two more. One guy, one girl. Or I mean, you can do it. You can do whatever you want, but just kind of yeah. following the original. Right. right, 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 right. Oh man, I don't know. I cause like I don't want to. Man, well, hopefully, the, hopefully there's like. Well, I guess there'd be a lot more if the video game yeah. were to come out today. You know, so. you know who I think is probably the the best waterman right now, and I'll put him up against. I think I know who you're gonna say, but yeah, no flegal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, riding anything, like whether it's wakeboard, even wake skate, wake surfer, skim surf style, foil, whatever. I don't think that anyone, and I know Kai Lenny is like a really strong board rider but Noah would dominate him in in the toad part like yeah. as far as wakeboarding is concerned and wake surfing and foiling probably and, pro- and, and, and foiling yeah. and foiling yeah. um but he like just hands down is the best water rider yeah i, I think that's a lot of people probably agree with that i yeah. think it's that's a solid list i like it okay but man, there, there's people I'm like not thinking about that are really good. Like Corey's obviously really good. Nick Rappa, like yeah, super great competitive guys. Mm-hmm. Raph would be probably good to put in there. Raph, That's a good one. Raph, like so good. Yeah, I feel like he was a really unsung hero for a long time. Like, yeah, who, that was kind who, of his. Who, his who, who, let me ask you three guys that you think like were really good but just never got the credit. I don't know if you can. I mean, I don't know if you can say Raph didn't get the credit. It was just his personality wasn't so much so like some other people who are loud. You know, he's more reserved. But I would say, yeah, it'd probably be fair to say he didn't get the credit he deserved because he probably deserved a lot more hmm. in terms of his, his riding and influence. But he would be, I mean, he's my GOAT. Like, I think he's the greatest of all time. Mm-hmm. Who's yours? You can say yourself if you want. No, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. I don't know. I don't know because you know? There, there's there's different things that I guess it's what do you determine yeah, yeah. is goat to yeah. me? I think it's like every aspect of wakeboarding, competitive, free riding, winch, park, boat, everything across the board. It's it's tough for anyone to to stack you up want, against Raf. You want to know the crazy thing now is you could have all of those things. You could be really good at all of those things, but if you don't know how to gather content, produce it, and distribute it. It's not like it used to be. Yeah. Before, that's all you had to do. Like, we just had to show up. Like, put be, some tricks down. Like, leave. be good, be ready for when cameras are rolling, where, wherever it is, or whatever. And then that's it. The, the other companies would take care of that. But now, like, the riders have to be their own media house. Yeah. And so now that is another thing that is stacked on top of the riders that they now, I don't want to say have to do that. They, we get to do that. Yeah. Right, like, and so we have we have that ability, that freedom. It's in your control now. Yes, yeah, which is cool. Um, so you don't have a goat. Mm, tough, but like, I I would go back and and say like, Noah is the best board rider. Okay. Um, he's the boat right now, the best of all time <laughs> right now. Okay, I th- I think so. Okay, that's yeah. fair. That's a good. I mean, I think him. I mean, Gunther is a new name that could be thrown in there. Um, but there's a lot of people that have done a lot really yeah. well. <laughs> I just like, to me, if, if you look at who is the best at riding a wakeboard behind the boat, where it all came from to me, Keith Lyman. Okay. Like he makes it look like it's supposed to look. I like that answer. That's a good answer. RV tour to reinvent wakeboarding. What mm-hmm. year was that? The big one was Oh three. Okay. So run me through what, or why that even happened. Uh, so there were some other bus tours out there and, um, I like the idea of being able to travel around to the tour stops in an RV, but it wasn't to go to the tour stops. That was the big draw is because uh, what I did was I created Sean Murray's backyard tour is what I called it because what I wanted to do was get back to what we were all really trying to do, where it all started, just having fun in our own backyards. If, if you lived on a lake or just getting out in the water for fun. And the, the contest scene was kind of like 
drawing people away from that. And so I just wanted to go and meet people where they were, and I would take them out on my boat. So I would tow my boat, uh, Nautique 226, and towed it around with the RV. And uh, so I did it like a year or two before, and then in 03, it uh, happened to be the, the year that the game came out, um, and my neighbor wanted to sell his RV. And so I bought his RV, had a TV in the side to so open up the bay, and it was like right there. It was like made for this to go. And um, we went and traveled around, like literally did a lap around the whole country. So if you just did a, a circle around the whole country, did that. Even went up to Canada, down to San Diego, did like over 10,000 miles. But it was a big year for me because um, it was a year that the game came out, uh, I proposed to my girlfriend who was then my, my wife, um, got married in 03 and started the boarding school with my buddy Travis in 03 and won the worlds. That's a big year. It was, <laughs> it was like really big. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you said this before, but it was kind of to reinvent your wakeboarding. Have you phrased it like that before that RV bus tour in a sense? Yeah, I think it was just, it was to get back to the roots of yeah. fun, you know, because the contests were kind of dictating, even though we would change the judging, we would have a, a, a meeting before every tour season to talk about how we're going to judge. The riders would? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the tour would bring us in. And so there was like 15 of us that would get together. They would have us over to World Pub and they would sit down and say like, what do you want? And so we, we did that. And uh, what was I even talking about? Uh, uh, reinventing wakeboarding. Yeah, so so grassroots, yeah, like the the contests were were pulling us into those kind of, even though like it still like wasn't the freestyle runs. They called it freestyle, but you had to do all these these tricks. But it was still like you're doing contests and you're go you ride your turns done and sit on the shore and wait. Yeah, right. Um, and we were training for those contests, and then we would do demos. But it was like you know what, I'm gonna get back to. I just want to go ride. Just want to ride because it's fun to keep ride. the balance yeah. of contests and free riding and yeah. having a, having a good time. Okay, um, got a random question here. So, who was the uh, actually no? Let's go this. Who, what's the worst slam you ever had that you that you remember? Uh, I got knocked out. So besides the knee dislocation, yeah. Um, in '06 when I came back, so '04 was when I said, "All right, I'm taking a year off." Dislocated my knee. Oh five, I'm out. I started to kind of ride a bit, but I was still real hesitant. But then once I got my confidence back, uh, I started to ride pretty well. Oh six, I went to ride in the tour. This is Phil Sovin, Rusty Milanowski time, right? Like they were battling. Phil would win everything, or Rusty would, and so I hadn't competed since oh three. I'm coming into first contest. This is in Atlanta. And they, it, they're at this season, we went head to head every round, one versus one. You go into that round, I like make it. to the next, you go to the next. So round one, Phil Sovin. I'm like, well, if you're going to do it, this is how you're going to do it. No chance for a safe pass here. We're just going to go all out. <laughs> just got to do it. I ended up beating Phil, like beat him out of that round. And I'm just like, this is sick. I've got my RV on site and I remember walking back. This is kind of like getting later in the day. I'm walking back to my RV. Byerly comes up and he's like congratulating me. And I was just like, Byerly congratulating. This is awesome. I'm just flying high. I'm sitting in my RV. I think we sat down, we start playing guitar or something like that. And then Chris Bischoff peeks into the RV, goes, Hey, storm's coming. We got to go into the next round right now because uh, or t a storm is coming for tomorrow. So now we got to, like, we thought we were done for the day, but we got to get a round done for, like, tomorrow we got to do it now. All right, get your board. You're getting ready to ride. You got to go against Shane Bonifay. It's like, all right, Shane can ride well. I, I got to do what I got to do. And uh, so I go out there, and I fall right away. And I get up, and I think, finish the pass decently. Coming back on my second pass, I fall again. I'm like, dude, I got to put something together. 
And so my buddy, Travis Moy, who I was running the, the boarding school with, he, he, he ran it and, and I was a uh, part owner with him there. He's the driver on tour. And he knew like what I could do, what I, you know, what I needed to do. And as the boat's turning around, he, uh, he asked me, or I asked him, I was like, should I do the KGB five? He goes, can't hurt. You know, just like trying to tell me like you need to do something. Go back when I, when I beat Phil, the song that he played was LL Cool J. Don't call it a comeback because I've been here for years. <laughs> like I'm going to knock you out. Yeah. Right. That's that song that he played every time I went off the dock. And I think he played it the second time. Shame. While I was going to shame. Right. So he's picking me up. Should I do the KGB five? Can't hurt. I did a KGB four fifty. Pow! Hit my head so hard, knocked me out. Didn't I? Didn't know I fell. Right? Like I don't remember much of the run. I wake up. I'm on the back of the boat because Travis got back to me before the pickup jet ski got to me. Drew McGuckin drive jumps in, pulls me out of the water. They, uh, they get me on the back of the boat and I'm sitting on the sun deck, just sitting there with my feet on the platform. And I, and I kind of come to consciousness, but I could only see out of my right eye. And, and then all of a sudden I just pass out again. And then I kind of come to, and I'm walking down the dock and I kind of wake up and then I pass out again. Like consciousness is in and out. And then I wake up on a folding chair, like this metal folding chair while the ambulance is coming in and I pass out and then I wake up in the ambulance and then I'm out and then I wake up on the folding table and in the ambulance no oh no sorry not the folding table the uh operating whatever oh, okay. i wake up in the hospital yeah and it's just like lights all around me cold table and they're cutting my suit off me and i remember i was like full on naked and it's freezing <laughs> and i think i even joked about that like i was in the pool like and like and uh so i had whiplash so bad concussion like I couldn't move my head for a month. Um, and uh, Chris Bischoff had to drive my RV home with me while I sat in the front seat. And I noticed that the bright light was affecting me differently sitting in there. I noticed that the sound was affecting me differently. And to this day, um, like I, if I'm sitting at a restaurant, I don't, I try not to face the window. It's just like it affects me differently. Mm. And so after that fall, um, really cautious. I, I don't, I don't like, n nobody likes taking a back edge. Um, <clears throat> but that fall, it, if I ever take a back edge, it's just like instant bad. Um, and so I competed for a long time, like 2006, like I, I had some decent runs and never won anything, but like I would make it in the even, next. Yeah. I was, I was still like able to put some stuff together and, um, you know, cracking off nines in my runs and like still putting some, some runs together. Um, and it was, I think around 2015, 2016, the movie concussion with Will Smith came out and they were talking about CTE, um, uh, chronic traumatic encephalitis or something. I don't like know that. the E part of it, but yeah. 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 So basically brain injury. And they were talking about these football players and how they, their personalities and things were changing. And I was like, this is kind of ringing a little bit true for me. Um, because if I would take a back edge, it would make me angry really instantly to where I'm like, I shouldn't be getting angry falling. Like it was like sparking something. Yeah. And then I noticed I was getting like a little bit like angry at things I shouldn't, whether it was somebody making a sound or doing something. I was like, this is not good. And so that's when I started talking to my sponsors about like, do I need to compete? This is 2016, 2017. And, um, I was like, cause I, I feel like I'm having some different feelings in my head, uh, from that crash. Um, and anytime that I'm getting ready for these contest runs, like I, I remember switch heel seven or toe back five, like I was taking some back edges. I was like, this is not good. And, uh, I haven't really talked about it too much. Like that's why I really stopped uh, competing is I, I wanted to stop hitting my head. Yeah. Um, and that's when I really started to find out, Hey, there's a different way to ride, slowing the speed down and taking a lot of these risks out of, you know, people are like, Oh, it's my knees and my back to, to me, like those in some sense, but to me, it, to, for me, it was more of head. Um, yeah. Broken bone or torn meniscus or whatever is you can come back. 
yeah. mentally, at least, it's not a big deal, yeah. you know, or it, it, it can be for some people, but the, the brain aspect of it yeah. is. So when, really when, when the sponsor, like when I talk to them, they're like, no, just keep doing what you're doing. Cause like social media was coming around and, and I was doing a lot of different things with that. And, um, they're like, no, just keep doing what you're doing. You don't have to go to the contest and, and the contest scene, not that it's not important. It's not what it was, you know? Um, and so it's, it's yeah. It, yeah, it's not as influential as it once was. Yeah, and, 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 and it's not to take anything away. I think the contest scene is great. I still go to it and, and see what, you know, guys are doing. And part of me is like, I wonder if I could go compete and, and, and try some stuff. But um, they're really good. And they, and like they ride with massive wakes all the time. I'll ride with massive wakes sometimes, but not like every time. And uh, so I, I think they're influential. I think they're important. They push the sport but we have so many different ways to connect with people. And for me, like my job, I want to inspire, like number one, I love that my job helps me stay active and like have a reason to go have fun. Um, but I also want to show people that pathway to fun, that pathway to longevity, uh, how to continue to stay young because you've heard the saying, uh, if you haven't, it's a good one is we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Got to make sure you say it in the right order. Right, yeah. Right? <laughs> but it's really true. It's, it's very true. really true. Yeah. Everybody thinks that like our peak years are like 18 to 25 because that's when we like feel the best. But honestly, if you think about it, it's probably because that's when you get into a school career of where you're probably not going to continue in sports if you were in sports. You're going into college. You're going into career. And you might schedule time for the gym, but we don't play like we did as kids. I think it's the most important thing to take away is that we, like as kids, we are cross training from one activity to the next. Now, honestly, kids nowadays, not so much. Now kids are like every parent thinks their kid is going to be the next whoever and whatever sport. They're going to get a scholarship and a, and a paycheck and everything. So the, the fun is getting stripped out of a lot of these sports. Some, some of them are starting to be brought back into it where they don't have to practice for four hours every day of the week. And every kid thinks they're going to be the next pro, whatever, like just stay active. Like little league baseball for me as a kid, we would kind of practice and you show up to the games and it was fun. Make it to the all-star team. Maybe like, but it's like, I, I don't know. I, I really think that our world has lost the, the playing aspect and everything like is such under a different microscope of not fun. Yeah, and, and you see it across the board. It's not unique to any any sport or any activity. You can see it, you know, wakeboarding, you start because it's fun. You do it because it's fun. And then at some point people might turn to it and go, Well, wait, does wakeboarding owe me something? I'm good enough now. Why aren't I why aren't I sponsored? Why aren't I this? Why aren't I that? It can happen with absolutely anything. And yeah. and the way and, and I really actually learned this by coaching people and from when I stepped out of the contest. And the reason we do almost anything, the reason you probably started this podcast is you're like, that looks fun. I did it for the money, Sean. Obviously. <laughs> no, but. <laughs> but the reason we do anything, it can be even your job, but it's a, like wakeboarding is easy to see because it's you, people sit still and watch you, right? But the reason we do anything is because there's some sort of fun in that some joy. You're like, I'm going to have some fun moments. Right. And there could be hardships through it. Like these, that's a struggle. That's work or whatever, or frustration, but you're eventually going to find that fun. And the things that we tend to go towards are the things that we naturally do well at, or we like the fight to get good at it. Um, but the things that we feel ourselves drawn to are where people respond well to us, where we get good reactions. So if you do well at something and then people are like, man, that was awesome. That's the ultimate experience because you're like, that's a fun moment. That's a great after moment. Wow. I want to do that again. And what happens is those things switch places. And so what we end up doing is we end up trying to get a good reaction so that we have fun. And in doing so, number one, we're not necessarily in the moment and we're possibly underperforming. So we're, we're also possibly not being true to who we are and what we can do. Because you're trying to shape yourself into getting a good reaction. So maybe your art is different than what you truly can do. Rather than, oh, people do, like, people really react well to if I do this video. 
or these kind of things. No, but what do you like doing? Like, why do you like doing that? Why do you like wakeboarding? Is because you can get a sponsorship or whatever. I've seen so many riders that are really, really good never ride again because they didn't get those things they felt like they were owed or whatever it is, a sponsorship, a trophy, a check, a high five. Like, oh, I don't want that. I got negative feelings from it. Well, it's because you, you essentially hand someone your joy in hopes of getting it back. So I got to remind myself, like when I lace up my boots, it's generally when I, it's my check-in, like you're doing this cause it's fun. Yeah. It's the Gene Wilder, like in the Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory, strike that, reverse it. You're doing it for fun. Don't ever forget that. It's cool when you get a good reaction, right? Like it's awesome. People in the boat, you throw a good method. Let's go. That's great. But always got to keep in check. But the, but the moment, like, don't forget you're standing on water, you're carving around. Like there are some really fun things that are happening. Don't miss that moment. And like I said, like you can actually perform a lot better a lot of times if you're not like trying to like, how are they portraying or like, how am I portraying myself? How are they receiving me? Am I going to have a good experience? Like you base your experience upon the reactions. You're missing it. hundred percent. So it, it seems like my job as a wakeboarder is to entertain people. But if I'm doing that, I'm missing the point of the gifts, the abilities, the opportunities, that moment of being out there. I like doing a rally because it's the closest thing that I can do to flying. It's Superman. I mean, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Some people think it's a silly trick. I don't care. It's fun. Like I like when I land, I, if it's really glassy, I like sliding on my back. If it's not glassy and it's crazy rough and I'm still trying to like do a tumble turn. Cause I know some people are like, Oh, I wonder if he can do a tumble turn. I'm like, I'm going to do it for the challenge. See if I can bounce from one wave to the <laughs> next. It doesn't feel nearly as good, but I'm doing it. Cause I'm like, I want to do that for myself. Like, cause it's, it's just fun. Like, but yeah, there's times where you got to go and like ride if the conditions aren't great or you're tired or whatever, because your job is saying, Hey, you need to go ride now. That's okay. Yeah. But I'm going to go find fun moments for me. Yeah. That's, that's a really good just point there to, to everyone, whether it's wakeboarding, snowboarding or baseball or whatever it is. Always remember that. That's a good omen to, to keep in mind. Um, so we're talking about kind of 2015, 2016 part of your career where, hey, competition, that's not really where I think I'm valuable right now. And I'm having some some reasons for that. Explain the transition of, you know, social media is blowing up content creation and you being a content creator is kind of coming to the forefront of what your career is. Explain that transition. Was that something that you consciously consciously was was thinking about throughout it or was it just kind of natural, you know, integration into content creation um the f i mean going all the way back my dad always had a camera on me and my brothers we have so much vhs which is now transferred to dvd which we're transferring to mp4 um it was to the point where we were just like dad come on you always have the camera i'm so glad he did so yeah. and thank you dad um so we I, i've always had like cameras going um, and then when detention came about, that was the first instructional series back from 1998. Um, I, my business partner flew me out to California. I thought I was just going to like con consult on some of the editing. Um, I hooked up with Ron Seidenglanz. He put me into his editing room, which is just a little side room, like a little office in his house. And I learned how to edit. He put me in there for a week and I just edited. And then we also shot that classroom stuff, which is another story. And, and so that's when I was like, oh, this is kind of fun editing. And over the years, as, as computers were developing and editing programs uh, started getting put into computers, then I was like, oh, this is fun. I'm going to start editing family videos. And at the same time, um, while those things are happening, Facebook, actually MySpace, I got into MySpace, started just creating a presence there and saw like the, the, the ability to connect with people there. Um, and then Facebook came around that same time. Eric Ruck would write these little guest blurbs uh, in wakeboard magazine. And I remember he wrote it. It was on the left page in the bottom half. And it's, it was basically, if you can't beat them, join them. And he was talking about social media and I was like, it's got a good point there. And so I went and grabbed around that time shortly after that Instagram came out. And so I immediately grabbed my name and I continued editing videos but wasn't able to really put them anywhere because Instagram was just pictures. 
Um, but when they went to 15 seconds, I was like, Ooh, now I can edit some videos on this. When they went to 60 seconds, that's, you can, you can look at my, like Instagram transitioned into YouTube because I was trying to go. I remember the first video I did, I went over to JD Webbs. The second one I did went over to Jimmy the Riches and I wanted to do like a day in the life in 60 seconds and frame for frame. I was like. I got to make sure that I make the most out of these things. And it was just too tight. And so I was like, I want to, I like this, but I'm just too constrained. So I need to park them somewhere. Am I going to do it on Facebook? Or am I going to do it on YouTube? Uh, I guess I'll go YouTube. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? But I, I made like a conscious decision. I was like, I'm not doing this to be a YouTuber. I don't want that. I don't want the expectations to kill me. I don't want to do this because like that is what I'm expected to do. I want to do it because I can do it when I feel like it, when I have an idea. And that's still how I want to do it. I've since set more goals. Like my goal is to do a video about one a week. Sometimes I do more. Sometimes I'm traveling so much I can't do that. And it's just tough. And I don't want to like run myself into Force the ground. It, yeah. yeah. And so I've just learned like I really enjoy doing that. And I have had good responses and that, I'm not like, okay, that's why I want to do it. But it allows me to know, like, man, I can make a difference around the world because I can't tell you, I like, we could look, I, I get the email from questions and comments. If you go comment right now, it'll pop up in my phone as an email. I haven't stopped that. It's a lot of emails. But I get so many, like, one of my favorite ones is the how to get up on a wakeboard. And, I, and I've done a few of those, but the most recent one shows the side angle and I've had so many people send me messages from around the world saying, I try to get up for so many times and then I saw this and it's helped me get up. That's awesome. I love that. Like, I, I love that people are out there having a good time because of the content that I can put out there. Um, it's very beneficial. Like, I have uh, a buddy of mine, Tim McGee. Um, he helps shoot. He, and he's great at shooting, flying drones, stills. Uh, he helps me edit. Um, we are constantly working together uh, on projects now so he can help me sustain a pace. Um, and I, I, enjoy, I truly enjoy it. It's like my favorite part of my day to where like a lot of times I get up really early so that I can edit because I really love telling a story and I, and I like the creation process. So you're editing these YouTube videos? Yes. Okay, I was going to ask who's in Sean Murray Corp because when I shot you an email, your wife responded. Yes. So she's your agent? No, she is my schedule manager. Okay. It's probably very helpful to have that. I've, I've had agents in the past and, and things like that, um, but I am me. I, I am who handles all of my media. Um, I create it all. Uh, Tim will help me create rough cuts. If it's a, 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 an easy enough edit, um, he will get it really close to how I want it. And like we, we've got one on how to foil coming out and – like you nailed it, dude. Like he's really learning like how to do it and um, in, in my style, my timing, but everything that I put out is, is going to be something that I edit. Um, but the reason that my wife uh, is the one answering those emails is because I was asking her because I get a lot of different requests to travel and go do things and, and of my time and I'm very grateful for it. But I was always saying, Hey, does this work? How about this? Does this work? Because as much as I consider, you know, myself to be the captain of my plane. She's flight control. Yeah. She is the flight control tower. That's like, you're going here with these people. At the, so I was like, can you just help me like not mess up? And because I don't want to double book myself. Yeah. Um, in fact, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she's, so she is the one who's like putting things in the calendar and, and helping with that. Okay. So, but, but Tim helps a lot with filming. Absolutely. Going on the boat, sh yeah, shoots. Yeah, because that's the thing about wakeboarding is like I, I can't really set the camera up. I've done it sometimes where it's like I put it on the, on the tower or try to go selfie, but um, for the most part, when we want to get that really quality stuff, um, we do that. That's cool. Yeah, he Tim kills it with yeah. a, lot of, a lot of video stuff. Yeah. Um, you've gone from being a professional competitive rider to what seemed like after competitive and still a little bit competitive, but professional free rider, doing a lot of videos to now being that kind of content creator status while still riding a lot. What does it mean to be a professional wakeboarder? Nowadays? Yeah. Uh, so it's really like, I would say having some ability, like if somebody wants to do it, 
like if they're looking like, Hey, this is what I want to do. Um, you need to have some like ability, but the biggest thing is how to convey a message about an experience. And if you can do that, I think most anybody can, can kind of make a go at it, but you're not going to like get rich quick, you know, like it's cool. Like, to, to get some, you know, to, to make money off of YouTube, th- that is not my sole income. It's not, you know, that I'm not there. Um, but it's cool to get that, that deposit. Like, that's cool to see that go in there. But if somebody wants to do it in wakeboarding, it, you can do it. And so you, you have to be very intentional. Um, and, and it takes time, as you know. Like, th- this, this part is, like, the, the easier part, like the, the easy fun part right here. Yes, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, and not that I, I enjoy editing. Yeah. Um, but that takes time. Yeah. Um, and so on average, depending on the video, depending on how many cameras I'm, I'm running and the, the song choices and things like that on average, like one minute is one hour of work between from when you grab a camera and you say, this is what I'm going to, and when you start scheduling it and everything, um, to when you upload it and you're like, now I'm moving on to the next project. So a 10 minute video is 10 hours. Yeah. You know, between the, the shooting, editing, uh, creating your Instagram edits, creating your, your thumbnail, uh, create, doing your upload, writing the description, writing your Instagram copy. There's a lot to it. There really is. Yeah. It's not just, it's not just, let's go record. And like, if you do live, <laughs> yeah, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should just do more of that. I'll just do live podcasts from now on and make my life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so talking about wakeboarding, um, you haven't ever ignored park riding. I would, I would even say that you've promoted and leaned into park riding quite a bit. Um, what got you to keep that part of the sport, basically stay open to it as in, I'm not just going to stay in my, my boat lane. I'm going to keep including this aspect. (laughs) Well, thanks for noticing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's hard not to notice. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of boat riders who have just stayed in the boat lane. Like this is all I'm going to do. And this is, yeah. this is my thing. So yeah. what, why do you choose to include that? Um, number one variety, you know, there, there's, there's challenges. Uh, th- it, it helps with like consistency and control. Uh, you can be out there at your own time. Um, I also just love how accessible it is. And so I, I want people to know that like, and I know there's not parks everywhere, but in other countries, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. There's like 80 in Germany. Germany's not a big country. So I, I love the accessibility. I love the variety. I love the, the community there. Um, OWC is, is a great setup, and, and sure, it's a plug, but um, to be able to walk to the boat, drive the boat out, coach out there, come in for a lunch break, take some laps on the cable in between, and then go back out and coach, like, that's a great day. Like, just to have that kind of setup or – yeah, it's, it's just a really fun aspect. The physics are a little different on, on park compared For to sure. boat. Yeah. Um, but that's just, I, I think that's what makes it fun. Would you say those two, two sports, cable and boat, are two different sports entirely or two different disciplines of the same sport? Disciplines of the same sport. Okay. Yeah. In the same way that I would even say like water skiing, going around the buoys and things like that. People are like, that's so different. No, like paintball is different. <laughs> like, like motocross is, is different in a sense. Like it's kind of similar, but like that's, we were talking earlier about water skiers. Like they were so similar. Like it's so similar. Like the physics are the same. We're just going faster and doing different challenges. Like, so I, I do think that park riding and boat riding are very, very similar, more similar than not. Um, the difference is when you go to hit a kicker versus hit the wake you're using a, a different power energy push and pull. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I would agree with that. I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, speaking of wakeboarding in general, who do you think right now in wakeboarding besides you in your own, in your own words is doing it right? Who is, who's really killing it right now in, uh, in wakeboarding it could be water sports in general, but I'd like to stick with wakeboarding first. Um, Depends on what you call doing it right. And you're in your eyes, who's doing it right? Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys that are, they're like riding well, check, right? There, there's a ton of guys that are riding well. Yeah. Um, that are gathering content, you know, 
like that, that list is endless, um, that are putting it out on a consistent basis um, and enjoying it. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. That's what, that's the separator. That's a few boxes to check. Yeah. Like ride well, grab the content, distribute it at a consistent basis, but enjoy it. I don't know. I'd have to ask. Ask who? Ask around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think some guys who are, who are doing pretty good with it, like Corey is, do- is doing it well. Um, I think Noah's doing it pretty good. I think he's enjoying it. How could he not? It looks like he's enjoying life yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Go from Hawaii, big wave surfing yeah. to. But there's, there's some, there's some guys, honestly, I'm not going to say who, but I, I think there's some that look like they're having fun, but I don't know if like, are they? Yeah. You know, that's a tell without talking to them. Yeah. Um, who, get, who gets you the most hyped to ride? If you're on the boat, wakeboarding besides Rusty, who gets you the most hyped to ride? Um, the one that blew me away that I was so pumped when he joined Hyperlight was Trevor Bauer. Yeah. Just, he's just like, ah, oh, just like his energy. I was like, yes, I want more of that. Um, and I know I keep saying it, um, and, and I have few and far between, uh, interactions because of, of his direction. I don't even know how much I can talk about it, but, uh, Lyman, like just the way his energy out of the boat is always good. Yeah. Like, really good. Um, but it can be, it doesn't even have to be like a name that, you know. Sometimes it can be somebody who is just like learning to jump the wake and they're just like, Oh, like I get it. Like I love showing people the physics of what's really happening because when that happens, you go, Oh, this is different than I thought. I love teaching people that. Um, and that could be anybody. And when they get it, I'm like, yeah, now I want to go do that. Right. Yeah. 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 I would say, it doesn't have to be a big name, but like I, I never did boat lessons, but I did cable lessons. And when you push that kid off the dock after a couple of times of, you know, maybe a couple of face plants mm-hmm. and he gets around the first lap, the, the stoke on their face is just, it's unbeatable. It's like, awesome. You can go land a new trick and I might not get that excited. Like, yeah, but it's, it's admirable. And it's, that's something that gets you stoked to ride. Um, no matter where the, where who's the somebody, skill level somebody is that, that, that you are like, I want to be, out I of mean, Mauer's a good one. I yeah. The Olf and Kai Dish, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah. They are, anyone that goes to the flats, to me, behind the boat, is just going to, you have my heart, because it's like. <laughs> name name top five guys to go to the flats. Randall. Yeah. Um, let's see. Scott Stewart went to the. Wow. He went big. So big. Yeah. Powerful. Very powerful. Trying to think back. You went to the flats quite a bit back in the day. For a day. For a while. For a while. Then, then, then the G came out. And you, went, you, don't <laughs> need, you don't need to. I've come. got a landing ramp right here. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. That's, a, that's something that gets me, gets me going. Dean Smith. Dean Smith. That's a good yeah. name. And Lyman. Yeah. Lyman would punt everything out there. And uh, yeah, Randall. Randall, I think, strictly went to the flats. He didn't really mess around with that second wake. He didn't like he, he would go back seven into the flats off the double up. Switch Pete into the flats. <laughs> <laughs> like some of the craziest things. Like, what in the world? Yeah. So crazy. Good. And, but, but Dean's, I think it was his rock star edit with, it was like 30, dirty 30 or something. Mm. 30 years old going boosting the flats. But yeah, those are some, some big names that I like watching. Um, we got a couple more random questions here, but I don't have a ton else. In terms of, you know, maybe the future of Sean Murray. What's what's the future hold for you? In Man, the I don't know. Industry. My, my, I haven't gone back to school yet. <laughs> you know, after we <laughs> set some goals, um, I don't know if I will. Probably won't at this point because it, it was like honestly a thought for like, I don't know, five years. I was like, yeah, I might. Immediately after you kind of, or, or a thought randomly in your life for yeah, a few like years. I'm, I might go back. Yeah, after wakeboarding, I might go back to yeah. school. Um, and in school, I was a marketing major. So marketing's kind of worked out. Um, I don't know if you'd learn a lot if you went to school for marketing. <laughs> I think yeah. you probably learned a lot. Boots on the ground. I, I think so. Um, but, you know, it, it's something I really don't know. Because I, I remember the first interview that I did. I was out at Crane's Roost Park. It was like with ESPN or ESPN2 or something like that. And they were like, so you can't do this forever. What are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm going to get to the end of the season and see what happens. And I, and I feel like that's what I've just done. You know, I, I basically just kind of work on contractual timelines. Like I, I generally am going to sign like a three-year contract with a company. You know, 
like, hey, this is what you're doing. This, these are the deliverables that you need to that you need to to attain. And so that's kind of what I've done. Um, so I, I think I'll do this for a couple more years. I don't know. I'm 47. I'm still doing this. Like I literally thought I was going to make it to 25 and then 30. And it's funny. I got to 30 I, and I thought I'm going to get to 33 because that's what Jesus did. And not, I ain't no Jesus, but that was just the number. I was like, maybe I could have a career like as long as Jesus life. Went. Hang him up. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be done. I got to like 35. I was like, wow. And then I was like, okay, 40 is it. And right now I'm staring at 50. Like, I, I think it's kind of cool. Like, I like bring on 50. Let's see what happens. Age is a number, man. You know, there's, there's nothing, nothing more to it than that. I don't know. So I, I really don't know. Uh, actually, before we kind of wrap this up, I did have, you, you've had three, I would say, long-term sponsors. Very long-term. Over two decades. Mm -hmm. Jetpilot, Hyperlite, and Nautique. Yeah. Is it tough going from initially getting signed all the way till now, is there a tough renegotiating process throughout your career of signing new deals? Or have these companies been very much so on the same page as you and you see eye to eye pretty easily and quickly? Well, you know, I, <laughs> funny question. Um, the, the thing about that is, you know, when, when you get into negotiating and talking about like, here's what we want you to do, here's what we're going to pay you to do it. Um, a lot of the times they're going to say, well, here is why we think this number, and we want to leave some of the, m the money because we're bringing up the kids, or you know, we want to leave, so we're farming up the kids, or so these kids can do it. And and I told them like I am doing what you want them to do, and they're not doing it yet. So as soon as they do it, then you can pay them that. But in the meantime, that's that's why I think I'm justified at this. And I've never been one that's just like pushing for max amount of dollars. You that's, want the max contract. Yeah. Because, yeah. and that's probably why I'm still with these companies. Like I'm, I'm not trying to get the absolute most out of this. I'm trying to get enough out of it so that I can do it. And that's what I'm grateful for is like, I can still do this and, uh, the companies still want to work with me. So that's a, that's a long time with the, Select few companies there. Very uh, impressive resume. Um, Nautique, they had the gray project. What was that? Not many people know that. Well, I'm pulling them out. You know, I That's, got sources. Wow. <laughs> so, um, years ago, I, I saw the bottom side of um, one of our boats. And I, I started asking. I, this is the thing. The questions were coming because I was shaping boards for a bit. <clears throat> and I wanted to know what they called the bottom parts of boats. And I said, what's this called? He pointed out, what's this called? And, uh, and I said, what are these things do? And he said, well, these are um, these lifting strakes, and they, they come from our ski boats, and so it allows a boat to get out of the, the water faster. And, and, and so when it's up running, it's on less boat, and so you get a smaller wake. And I'm like, well, that's, that's our wakeboard boat, right? Yeah, that's, you know, this is the flagship for a long time. And I was like, I think we're making boats. I didn't say it to them, but inside I went, I think we're making boats wrong. Or, or we can make them differently. Um, and so when I had the opportunity, it was kind of a long story that how it finally came about. Um, but when it finally came about, I said, this is how I think it should be. But it was really like Eric Miller, uh, who, who, who engineered the project of how we're going to dig a hole and what we did with the water after it. And, <clears throat> when they started showing me the timeline there, so they brought me in, they go, Hey, this is how long projects going to go. And it was this huge board bigger than this wall. And there, and it was years. And they're like, this is what happens here. And this happens here. And this boat model goes here and this goes here. And I was like, this is going to be a long project, like really long. And I think originally it was supposed to come out in like 2010 or something, but going farther down the road, and uh, one of the things that they, they did with it was they changed how a boat is built, how it's put together. But one of the biggest things they did was subfloor ballast. Because what everyone was doing with boats up to that point is they were taking ski boats, right? Because what, what happened was first you have these, these little ski boats that then they go, hey, if we put an open bow into the ski boat, 
then we can get more people. We open our demographics. So now you've got your family. It's not just like the serious skiers. Now you've got your family. You can fit more people in there. Then eventually they figured out V drive. This is around when we were using like ballast in, in boats. And if you put weight into a boat, you get a bigger wake. And that was where the V drive started to come in. So that social atmosphere opened up, open bow. And so everybody was like, oh, this is the way to go. And everybody was creating basically the same thing. And so they were working within the same skeleton. And then when the Project Gray was going on, because what, what it was is they, like, this was a top secret project that nobody could talk about. And so in the back it was called Project Gray. And they showed uh, of this new plan that they were going to, you have 102 inches beam. That's the width of the boat. You can only go 102 inches wide before you have to trailer something uh, or get a permit to go down the road. And then we're going to start with a 23-foot boat. That is where, so we've got this box. But what people haven't done is they haven't gone this way. And so when they grew it this way, they're like, oh, you can put subfloor ballast and still have all your storage. They're like, oh, that's going to be awesome. When I saw it in person, I was like, whoa. So if you came from skiing previous, you walk up to a boat on a trailer, you can look inside the boat. You walk up to a G and it was like the side of a barn compared to what, what we had seen. It's because the ballast tanks were under there and they just were like, we're not going to stop there. We're going to, we're going to make this thing how we want to make it. And when we started testing it, the, the wake was so much bigger and more robust than anything that I was like, you guys, this is a whole different, this is a different sport right now. Like this has got some real mass to it. And the other riders started getting on it eventually. And, and, uh, it was around then that they were like, okay, we got to come up with a name. They had workshops and they, they brought in a company and this and that and all the other. And, and the G came from Project Gray in the end. It's pretty cool. Like, that's where it all came from. So that was a longer answer. Of well, that's a good answer. <laughs> top top secret. Yeah. That's pretty. Uh, so how long would you say from the, you said it was several years, but from the beginning of that design of, you know, we need to read it. We're redesigning mm -hmm. this shape of the boat to yeah. when the G came out. Do you remember how many years that was? I mean, it was probably five years. Okay. Yeah. It's a full endeavor. And, and I'm probably underestimating because it came out in 2012. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. It's an investment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a couple more random questions, but other than that, I think we can probably wrap it up here. Uh, favorite cover you've ever had on a, on a magazine? Probably the reflection shot. Okay, that's what came to my mind as yeah. well. That's a, yeah. I'll put the I'll put the photo of that in right now because that is a one of a, the most iconic. I would say it was an accident. Photos. Yeah, like I was not that I wasn't falling. Like people think that I'm sliding, or it was like it pops up all over the internet. Like this this moments before disaster kind of stuff. <laughs> or this guy loves himself. Like because I'm like looking at myself. Um, but. Yeah, it, w it was something that the week previous, um, I was just doing a lap around my lake during a sunset. I wanted to just go for a carve, and I grabbed the handle behind my back, and uh, so I'm just kind of riding blind, and I was seeing how close I could get my nose to the water. And when you're doing it, there's so much pressure and force going through your body. You can only stay there for so long, but I'm, like, getting really close, really close, and I'm like, oh, how close am I getting? And so then Joey Meadow, buddy of mine, photographer, he was coming out to shoot some photos for another company we were, we were doing. And uh, I go, hey, before we do this shoot, can you take a photo of me really quick? I want to see how close I, I'm getting to the water. He's like, yeah, sure. Snaps a couple pictures. We go about the shoot. He normally doesn't go into, the, into my house after and pull the computer out, but I think he saw it in his camera. He's like, I want to see this. So he pulls his computer out, sets it on my kitchen table. He goes, dude, look at this. And he shot at landscape, so it wasn't vertical. And I was like, oh, my God gosh, this is crazy. Like, dude, you should, you know, he's like, I'm going to submit this. Like, yeah, you should submit it for a cover. So he submitted it. They go, that's awesome. Can you guys reshoot it, but vertically? Because this, we can't fit this on a cover. We tried three times. One time we're out there and it has to be absolute. Like if a duck goes across the lake, it's, it doesn't work. We're about to like, we're at, we had to idle like the slowest to get to one end. So we get this long run, we get everything set up. And a jet ski, <laughs> like, well, that day's done. Tried it two other times, never got that same lighting, the same texture. And we just pushed, like, can you guys try to just lay this up? Like, and see, and it, and it worked out. Yeah. Um, and so it literally someone was like, hey, see, let me see how close I'm getting my nose to the water. 
your your body's nose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, not, not a board note right, is what right, I was right, trying right. to refer to there. Uh, you lost the battle for the boarding school. And I just want to know, is that the worst loss? You know, can <laughs> take all your contest losses. I was like combined. the battle for the boarding school. Shoot. What? A, no, it was on co- It was very nice. It was, it was a good, good split. This is referencing a, a, a funny video, um, that I dug up, but wow. you can, you can explain it. Yeah. Wow. I forgot about that. Yeah. So Travis, uh, Travis and I started the boarding school back in 2003, the big year. And, um, and then OW Street, oh, like Nautique or Correct Craft bought OWC and they said, hey, you want to come coach over here? I said, okay. So um, we split ways. And it was awesome because he's, he's a Mastercraft guy. I've been a Nautique guy. And so there was always kind of like that rub there. And we were okay with it. The companies, maybe not as much. But um, so when we went, we were like, let's make it seem like this is a real battle. So we created a bunch of like silly games. And uh, Wow. Travis edged you out. Is that is that <laughs> that video's online? It's I watched it a couple days ago, so it's still somewhere. Is it on my YouTube channel or something? I don't think it's on your YouTube channel. It might be, but I, I thought the one I was watching had like 200 subscribers or something. Yeah, but it was maybe on. Wayport Mag or something. It could have been, but it was it was a funny video. <laughs> uh, That's most funny. most famous person in your contacts. Uh, I don't know. You don't know. You got Tony Hawk's number. No, I don't. No. Probably would have changed even if you didn't okay. get it back. I, I told you I, I came across him three times. First time I coached him wakeboarding in San Diego Bay, like in 1997, 98, right? So, like, I'm getting started. I could wakeboard pretty well. I think I was pro and um, coached him there. Or just went out. We did some kind of shoot, and, and I think he rode. I don't know if I coached him. We rode together. X Games. I'm in an elevator, and he comes in. And I was like, oh, hey, what's up, Tony? think he's going to remember me. He's like, hey, how's it going? I was like, he goes, that nice to meet you. I go, actually, I, I met you uh, in San Diego Road. We wakeboarded out there. He goes, oh, were you the boat driver? I was like, <laughs> no. Yeah, sure, man. <laughs> no. Um, all right. Got up. See you later. <laughs> got up the elevator. It's like, oh, my gosh. That just, like, took me down a notch. But. The next time we saw each other, I had a video game with him. <laughs> kind of oh, this guy. Okay. I know this guy. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Rusty Malinowski. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> the, the pay it forward program with your 2008 Pro Model. Can you just kind of kind of run me through that? Uh, I had some extra boards in my garage. And I was like, man, I'm, you know, I, I'll pass them on to people that often. Or people ask for charities or whatever. And I'll, and I'll hand them out. But I was like, you know what? I want to see if like this board, I'll, I'll hand it to somebody and then they'll pass it on to somebody else. And so I just told, I brought it to OWC. I brought a box. I go, hey, ride this. When you're done, ship it to somebody else and tell them to do the same thing. And the thing like, and, and I put like a, a notebook with it. Just write what you thought about it, sign it, send it. And so it, it, it did that. Um, the next year, I told Hyperly, I was like, can I get three boards, one of each size, specifically for this? And so shipped them around the country. Third year, they created a graphic. That's where my graphic, it's like these recycle logo things. That's where that came from. And uh, so I don't know where two of the boards are from the year that I had three traveling around, but somebody sent me back the black one. And it's actually up on my wall in my board shop, in my, or my workshop, and... Cool thing is, is Kane Ward, his dad, Justin, came over and Kane is coming over to shoot at my house and he sees it up on the wall and he goes, there's my signature right there. He actually wrote, he wrote oh, wow. it. I think this is probably before Kane was born. Yeah. Full circle though. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah. He, did Kane ride that board? No. Like after, after the, when he came over and you saw it on the wall. No, he, it's, didn't take it for a while. I haven't taken it down. <laughs> kind of cool video. Right. Um, that's all I got, man. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about or any, anyone you want to thank? When did you get into wakeboarding? Uh, born 95. Man, I probably. graduated high school. I was <laughs> riding pro by the time. Shouldn't have said I was Wait. born 95. I'm pretty, I keep the my age kind of tight to the chest there, but. That's fine. <laughs> uh, got into it 2004, maybe? 2003? You know Behind what? a pontoon. Okay. And first board? CWB. Don't remember the name of the board, but it had hinge tech bindings. No, my. That's the first board I was mine. Where did you ride? First board you rode? I, Any idea? No idea. No. Colors of that board that you rode? Blue. The Blue. very first one. Probably Zane's. 
It had the sandal binding, so it had the little on the back and then on the top. It was yeah. old. Yeah. When I wrote it, it was old. Uh, you prefer boat or cable? Cable. Uh, favorite cable park? That's a tough one. The one I have the most fun at is just my home park, Michigan. Action Action Wake Park in Michigan. Yeah. Just because you can't beat the vibes of the, you know, all the friends hanging out. Yeah. Valdosta is probably the – Valdosta or Elevated are the two that I would say are my favorite in terms of, like, their setup. I, almost every time that Rusty and I drive by, we, like, try to give a shout-out. But one time we pulled over to Valdosta, and, like, almost – like nobody was there. It was a ghost town. What time did you get there? It was like six o'clock. They're getting dinner or something. Okay. Like that. Yeah. You should have you ridden there? Uh uh-uh. Oh, it's three hours away. I know. You gotta ride there some at some time. Yeah. It's so fun. We did a I did a uh tour around the Florida cables back in the day with Ruck and Jimmy LaRich. And we went to McCormix, uh Revolution, Rickson, and then back up to O dub. Was that all the ones that were there then? Yeah. There's quite a few more now, but yeah. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Yeah, you got to get up to Valdosta. It's a, it's a good time. Have you ever ridden behind a Paragon fully loaded? So I've ridden behind like three wakeboard boats in my life. Mm-hmm. I rode behind, my parents had an X2 2006, back when the prices of boats were a little bit different. Um, and that was like a wakeboard boat then. To me, it was crazy. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Um, and then Adam Wensink had a Nautic 210 that he did a demo on, and I took, like, a lesson with him. What year is this? 2008, maybe? On the Muddy Mommy? Muddy Mommy? No, no. He, he, oh, he brought it He to went you. around, and he, oh, did, got a, it, he yeah. did a tour up in northern okay. Michigan, and I did a stop there. And yeah. It might have even been before we had our wakeboard boat, but I said I want to learn to flip, and he says, no, you can't jump the wake toe side yet. You can't learn to flip. And I was like, where's the fun in that, man? I want to learn to flip. Like, what are we talking about? So rode behind that, and then... Most recently, I've ridden behind a 2023 Mastercraft XT20, but it wasn't fully loaded or anything, but I had a lot of fun. So those are the three wakeboard-specific boats I've ridden behind. (laughs) Okay. One day, you have to come uh, and try, like, my Paragon fully loaded. The wake is bigger than this table. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't be able to handle it. And, and it's not that you have to go hit it. It's just to stand next to it and you look at it go. Serve me a double up and let's just, let's right? just rip into it. No joke, <laughs> that thing is head high. Yeah? Yeah, the double up. If, oh, if Paragon like loaded, it's yeah. head high. And, it, and it's so steep that it's hard to get to the top sometimes. You, you like get pulled through it. I was like, going to say you go up to the top and come back down because it's so you steep. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Skinny stance on cable? Uh, Shoulder width. Shoulder width. Yeah. So not all the way on. Uh, I think I'm, I actually ride directional. So I have back foot all the way, in, or switch directional. I have front foot all the way in, back foot one insert out to the left. Hold on. Are you right foot forward or left foot forward? Right foot forward. And you ride? So I have the right foot on the most skinny insert. Yeah. Left foot and one insert to the left. Okay. And then I have left foot at 12 degrees, yeah. right foot at six. That's kind of how I snowboard. It's, uh, it's a uh, lot of fun. Yeah. I don't know why. It's just, I think it's a lot of fun. I've tried all sorts of stances, and I don't know. John Dryling told me that if I changed his stance by one degree, he'd notice. I haven't tested it yet, but I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, man. Any uh, Anything else? Anyone you want to thank? I mean. Man, uh, I mean, my parents, obviously. Like, my, my mom and dad, like, they live one mile down the street from me, and they're awesome. Oh, they're here. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and, uh. Yeah, just provide an amazing life, and and they still do, you know. Like it's it, it's great having them. I've got my older brother up in D.C., younger brothers in California, so I, I you know, I'm spoiled. I'm having them here, um, so I'm very grateful for my parents. Um, my wife, you know, she she puts up with my travel and and is very supportive in everything that I do. And my kids, my kids have grown up with me traveling, and not that like they like me traveling because they're like you going again i'm like yeah i do have to go like it's a job like i have to get that part um but my kids are very cool about it and and now they're really starting to kind of fall in love with being out in the water um because they've always done it but now they're they're starting to find their own kind of niche they're n- they're not like wakeboard phenoms and i think part of that has been because like they feel as my kids like people are watching them like my kids yeah um, but it's also because, like, I have a boat that the wake is really big naturally. Like, I went out and pulled my, my daughters. I have three girls. I pulled them 
they're riding double, switching off with each other, and the wake at the smallest behind the boat is pretty big. <laughs> um, but my youngest eight year old, she's like, "Yeah, I can go wake to wake." I was like, "You could, but let's let's work on your soft landings first. <laughs> like, let's let's work one on wake it. jumps. Let's get those dialed." Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, just, uh, my family, very, very supportive. And, uh, my brothers, Chris and Paul, they've been amazing. Um, and to, to not think the, the, who I consider to be the creator, God almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. Like, I mean, that's why I'm here. Why I get to do, I'm 47 years old, still wakeboarding professionally. I don't think it's for necessarily like for me, but for me just to get to share the love of life and, and his good news. Love it. Awesome, man. Uh, yeah, that, that wraps it up here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure to what, – what does everyone need to do at the end of the video, Sean? Enjoy the ride. If you're watching on YouTube, you need to – Oh, hey, so if you guys don't subscribe, make sure you do that. I mean, you can. You could consider doing that. And also hit the notification bell because then you know when videos are going live. If you get that first comment, you'll probably get some good thumbs up or something like that. That's always cool. Don't forget, he also has a Patreon that you guys can go check that out. And if you guys have any questions or comments, you guys can do those below because it's always fun to have that interaction to know, like, what do you guys like? You got questions more for him, for me. He'll fire off the questions to me. I'll check in on that. Let us know. And what really makes a difference, like, no joke, if you guys like and share, then the algorithm pushes it out that much more. So, like, all you have to do is literally just go share and then maybe push it out there just a little bit and be like, hey, maybe check this out. This, this out. These guys they're sharing some random stories that maybe, maybe you like, hopefully you got this far. They're definitely going to like it. That's a pro right there. That is a certified pro. I love that. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. See ya.